things to get into real quick before we get into the goodness. Um, we don't have a Shea today. I'm running all this production myself. You certainly helped set it up. I didn't, I didn't do all this behind the scenes by myself. And so, of course, I wear the shirt to uh, indicate how valuable her help is. Um, in fact, it's invaluable. So, yeah, she's laid up on painkillers, had some dental work. Everybody, everybody knows what that like. What, what that's, what that's like? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe I'm on the painkillers. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did we accidentally drink each other's beverages? So, uh, yeah. So, in, in, with that in mind, if anything is a little off, if my volume is down, or if, uh, yeah, I see some people saying my volume's too low. Okay, well, let's fix that. How about this? Better, better? Let's work on that. Let's get this solved first. How's that volume? Is that better? Okay, not quite. How about that? Still really low. Okay. Well, we'll maybe have a little false start here. How about now? Well, let's see. Let me let, let, me let my guests introduce themselves while I uh, get my volume situated here. Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel is here. Say hello. Hi. Hello. Yes, I'm, I'm Gemma um, from Secrets of the Citadel. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, let me know in the chat. It's an honor and a, a pleasure to be invited on History of Westeros. Um, I'm excited to get into what is a rather large text. Um, I read it through one time as a fan and now I'm plowing through for a second time making my notes. Um, and I'm already finding things that I can't recall from the first read. So I'm actually really interested in getting everybody else's opinions because I'll I'll probably be taking notes myself from you guys <laughs> because there's so many things you know second time round uh, there's still going to be so much that I've missed and that you know you'll pick up so uh yeah I'm really excited to get into this particularly this topic some exciting stuff we're going to talk about so thank you for having me on right on very glad to have you how's my volume now is this better Still super quiet. Wow. Okay. Well, let's see. Let's have Quinn introduce himself while I work on this a little more. Then, Quinn from Ideas hey. of Ice and Fire, say hey. Yeah, I'm Quinn from Ideas of Ice and Fire. I'm really excited to be on here. It's my first time I'm on History of Westeros. I'm really nervous, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it'll it should be fun to talk about this book and the higher mysteries of Fire and Blood. There's a lot of cool stuff going on here, and yeah, it'll be exciting to have this chat with you guys. Can't wait. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, My name is Emmett, a.k.a. Poor Quentin from uh, Not A Cast, which I do with uh, Jeff Bartline, a.k.a. Brendan Beefish. I covered a season seven of Game of Thrones for Deadspin. 
And uh, you might see my stuff on Game of Thrones and Vulture and Vice. And I also write a lot of stuff on Tumblr. And uh, I like talking about the magical part of the series a lot. I was just arguing with uh, Jeff on the podcast about a question our friend Matt, a.k.a. Joe Magician, asked on Twitter about what part of the series you could get rid of. And I was sticking up for magic as something you can't get rid of. Okay, how am I sounding now? Any better? Any better? <laughs> we love live audio problems. Everybody loves this. <laughs> Riveting. Okay, so I don't see any complaints. Better? Okay, better. Much better, everybody says. Okay, good. All right, well, I'll pump it up a little bit higher. All right, what about this? How about now? How about now? Getting better, getting better, getting better. Getting better? So much better? Okay. It's strange because offline when we were chatting ahead of this, everybody sounded fine. Um, okay. All right. Uh, one more. One more tweak. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, see what happens when we don't have a Shea? Everything falls apart. All right. So, our general plan for today is to um, review the early parts of Fire and Blood vis-a-vis -vis the higher mysteries, uh, as in magic. Higher mysteries is a fancy way to say magic. Um, that's how the, you know, the masters of the kid will say it. And we'll go, we'll follow their lead, even though we don't follow their lead on most things magic. They're, you know, you know how they are. Those masters, they're always downplaying the magic. But this is not that kind of episode. We're going to, we're going to upplay the magic to make a new word. Um, and, uh, we're going to have, uh, several different ways we're going to do this. The, since there's like quite a bit of magic in this book um a lot of it is a little unexpected um and a lot of it is uh, kind of blatant almost like like really uh not the kind of magic we're used to but maybe what we should be getting used to because the as the uh series still progresses with problems. only two more books which got to be we're gonna have all these major magic things happening we have the uh the others coming the dragons are gonna be you know fully deployed instead of we really have volume issues still. Okay, so we have a lot of people working, having trouble with the stream. I wonder, um, yeah, I'm not sure what we could do. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to hand over uh, a short topic for these guys to talk about while we work on this. It's possible we're going to have to restart the stream. I do not know. Uh, so it can't be that people are saying get the mic closer. The mic is right in my face. It's, it's definitely not the issue. Okay, so let's start. It's pretty loud right here. Let's yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so what we need to do is let me let me take let me pick a, a quick one of our early discussion topics and have these guys run with it while we try to figure out what's going on. Okay, so we'll do uh, my my first choice for the early topic was the, one of the first bits of magic we get, possible magic, which is Visenya. She's m someone who m is mentioned to dabble in black magic. So what we'd like to see is how potentially. Magor himself is either a product of black magic or his recovery was a product of black magic or anything else re regarding that. So y'all go ahead and run with that while I continue to work on this issue. I think it's a strong possibility that Magor's birth was a result of black magic in some way, given how much of his life is connected to it. His recovery, as Aziz said, a connection to Tiana of the Tower, which is some overtly sorcerous stuff. The general aura of sorcery around Visenya, which Fire and Blood makes sure to mention above and beyond what we've heard about her before i wouldn't be surprised i mean she had this kind of desperation to keep up with rainus in terms of creating an heir for Aegon. magor i mean obviously magor's cruelty we see cruelty like that present in the series with people who are not associated with sorcery but something seems to have been off about him from the very beginning the way he's described so obviously this is probably not the kind of thing martin ever wants to explicitly confirm but if i had to come down on one side i would say yeah magor magor is a result of magic from the start yeah, I think so too. Um, I think it might have something to do with the reason that he was infertile and had all those kind of like messed up, deformed babies as well. Um, yeah, I feel like Vicinia was definitely doing some weird kind of blood magic. I'm not sure how she got up. I'm not sure how she learned it, but yeah, it's pretty clear to me. And I kind of have this image in my head of Vicinia kind of like becoming kind of like this old witch crone that grows more and more bitter over the years throughout Fire and Blood. So yeah, I see it. 
Yeah, I kind of I'm I'm in agreement. Um, again, like you, Quinn, um, if you had to ask me how said hypothesized procedure would work, I, I wouldn't really be able to help you on that one. Um, but I mean, it's the same with everything, isn't it? With George R. R. Martin, this term conceived via black magic, it's it's rather vague, but it's certainly hinted at heavily in Fire and Blood. And we've had previous hints from the world book, the world of ice and fire as well. Um, but I think the mystery that surrounds it, it, that's kind of the point, isn't it? This is the higher mysteries that we're talking about. And like um, Aziz said, given the maester's general anti-magic stance, obviously Fire and Blood's written by a maester, it's not as though we would have expected them to outline any proposed theory of what exactly happened. In fact, I think given the fact that the Maesters even refer to magic as higher mysteries, it's almost a way of them distancing, distancing themselves from the concept of magic itself. Um, I actually think, in addition to what you guys have said, that this could have been one of the reasons why Aegon and Visenya were reported as drifting apart in the later years. I think if this was the case, um, there's a very good chance that Aegon either knew or at least suspected. I would wonder um, whether or not Magor is actually even uh, Aegon's son, or if, he, or if his, or if he doesn't even have like a paternal figure. I, I, cause like I said, I don't, I don't know the process. So an interesting thought w would be because uh, Rainy slept around or was Jaehaerys or Magor, were they, I, or I, was either one Aegon's children? They could Anies. both be, yeah, Anis. Yeah, uh, they could. They could both be, not. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Um, so that'd be interesting. Uh, both children were born quite late in the day, weren't they? Um, I did a quick math, some quick maths. I think Vasenya would have been about forty years old. I mean, I know. Um, there are older mothers in this text. Um, Rogar Baratheon's wife queen she had uh, i think she was like 46 when she had jocelyn i mean she died but um she also had um the the son i can't remember his name there's so many new names in this book isn't there? <laughs> that's the one yeah i'm i'm working on my family tree i'm going through house baratheon there's a lot of additions for house baratheon um so yeah, and, and it got to the point where everybody in the realm pretty much just assumed Visenya was barren. And then she kind of walked out one day and said, oh, hey, everybody, I'm pregnant and I'm going to have a boy. She was very confident that it was going to be a boy. It could have just been a good guess, but there could have been more to that. And as you say, the mechanics are very hidden because so much of whatever Visenya's magic might be is rooted in the sorcery of Valyria. And we really still don't know much about that. So much of that is shrouded in mystery because of the doom and because the Targaryens aren't exactly going to tell anybody what it is they learned or what it is they brought over from Valyria before the doom. So we'll, we'll never really know the mechanics of what Visenya was working with if she did. And I agree with Quinn, the imagery surrounding Magor later in life with his inability to conceive in the way Visenya is kind of framed as a classic witch archetype described as like the flesh melting off her bones. That seems very suggestive that this is wasn't just something that started to pop up once Magor got older, that it was baked into the cake from the start and kind of doomed him in a variety of ways, even before he had a chance to act, really. I mean, you sound fine to me. Obviously, that's not True. helping everybody yeah. chat. We can hear you just fine. Oh, they can't hear you at all now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, we wait for these technical difficulties to get figured out. Um, can we come back, Quinn, to what you were saying about mm -hmm. neither yeah. of Aegon's children being his? That That's a pretty interesting implication. That suggests Aegon was infertile or sterile, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it would make sense. So if Aegon knew he was infertile, 
or at least suspected that Aeneas wasn't his true-born son, mm -hmm. then he wouldn't be expecting to have a child with Bessenia. So when she wandered in one day and said, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant, that would have been yeah. quite a shock for Aegon, right? Um, and, and, I, and I think yeah. this is why he distanced himself. He didn't just distance himself from Visenya, he distanced himself from Magor as well, mm -hmm. because Magor stayed with Visenya when they separated, and he stayed with Aenys. So does that suggest that he knew that there was something weird going on, something that he didn't, didn't approve of, perhaps? And maybe he saw something in Magor that was off, like you said earlier, something about him that hinted at the fact that he had unnatural beginnings. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like, I, I, I'm not saying that Joffrey had unnatural beginnings, but it's kind of like how Robert Baratheon like saw very early on that there was something seriously wrong with Joffrey. Um, I think it might have been something like that. Or Ramsay, you have the horrible mm -hmm. story of his conception, and that's not sorceress, obviously, but it does have that kind of weird, just like the horror of your conception adds to the horror of your adult life. So I think that's a recurring theme in the series. And it's I think there's also the recurring theme of blood magic backfiring. Like, if Visenya engaged in blood magic to produce an heir for Aegon, it backfired horribly because the line didn't proceed from Magor. Magor yeah. was unable to conceive and have children. And after Magor was dead, the line proceeded from Aenys' descendants. So yeah. it's not just not just horrific in terms of the magic she's work she's using. There's not even a cold pragmatic justification for it because it ultimately backfired on her. It's great irony. Mm -hmm. Son, but it ends there and he will produce new heirs. Yeah. yeah, that this dynasty that he created actually stopped at him. I mean, that's very George R. R. Martin. Um, what you said, Emmett, about Visenya, when she got older, she was very thin and emaciated looking. That actually kind of gave me a bit of an echo back to Stannis Baratheon when he was having his soul sucked out of him by Melisandre, or however you want to interpret that. And um, was there some kind of trade-off? Magor's robustness for her life force? Uh, yeah, there's a weird, like, Dorian Gray dynamic almost going on there. Yeah. Where where Magor is taking on the life force that Visenya is kind of giving up. And I agree, it's very similar to, to how Stannis and Melisandre work, which... I don't know if that makes Magor analogous to the Shadow Baby. I guess so, which is is interesting to yeah. consider. But yeah, Magor is kind of this the, the weird after effect of that. And same with Stannis. Like it's constantly emphasized that Stannis never had a kid. That his marriage bed feels cursed. That he he can't like have proper fertile procreation the way he wants, and that he he feels that he's can't produce an heir the way Robert can. So I think those all those same things come together. Yeah, and there's like a lot of emphasis on balance in the in the series, like only death can pay for life and so yeah so yeah if if for meg were to have this kind of vitality and strength it weakens us and you in the same and in a lot of other ways in the series okay how do i sound now we may have solved it maybe way too loud now um, Aziz is just trying again, so if you could let us know in the chat if you can hear him, that would be great. Okay. We cannot, uh, we might, yay, everybody says it sounds good. Okay. There's a whole mess of chat messages all at once that say yay. Okay, well, sorry about all that, f folks. False start. We still don't even know what caused that in the first place. It's kind of one of those turn it off and turn it back on kind of problems <laughs> that seem to work. They Let's said look. the cat must have chewed through your wires. Yeah, we'll blame the cats. That's a good idea. <laughs> we'll, we'll blame the cats. Okay, so... All right, so you guys had a great discussion there about Visenya. I, I don't even know if I have any more to add to it. I, I was able to keep keep up with it despite um, uh, being a little uh, out of focus on um, on our end here. But it looks like you guys covered it really well. Hey, that's the benefit of having such great guests. I can sit here and say nothing and uh, the conversation's amazing without me. So, cool. Good job, guys. <laughs> uh, hush. I wonder, um, one thing I wanted to throw out there, I don't think I heard this mentioned. It's not directly related to, to Megor's life <laughs> or lack thereof or his... Uh, of, you know the thing that made him come into being uh, is the the idea of Valyrian rights for uh, Magor's second marriage and Visenya herself 
oversaw the marriage under, you know, it was a, a ceremony of blood and fire, I believe is the wording, something like that. And I wonder if that's, that doesn't sound like it has to be overtly magical, but it's kind of the job of the, you know, the, the priestly types to do the marriages, right? We have Mel- Melisandre did a marriage in the North, right? We, of, of, of Alice Karstark and um, uh, Sigorn. And so, and she's obviously a practitioner of magic. So it's kind of like usually septons aren't magic users, but it's like, this is kind of that role. She's kind of playing both roles, she's kind of straddling like the role of the, of the priest, but also we know she's, she's tied up in black magic a bit. So I wonder if, did any of you guys, did that line catch any of you guys um, tickle your fancy at all? Did you have anything uh, that, that, that um, made you think about it all? It warranted a post-it note about <laughs> as far as I got. <laughs> I think uh, I put, what? <laughs> and then just took a note in and come back to that one. <laughs> the, the beauty of new material, right? We all have so much yeah. like, well, I know that's important, but I don't have time to think about it right now. I got to think about exactly. these 25 <laughs> other things. <laughs> what, it, what it reminded me of was Danny's line from when she is at Drogo's funeral pyre and she thinks this is a marriage too in, in regards to her earlier marriage to, to Drogo that in some way this this magical ceremony this rite is a kind of marriage between Danny and her identity between Danny and Drogo's life force whatever you want to call it it, it kind of reminded me of that and something I'm really interested in seeing in both more of Fire and Blood more of A Song of Ice and Fire is how much connection there is between that Valyrian magic and R'hllor and whether there is a strong connection or not much of a connection and one way we might be seeing that is with the Red Priests in the Volantis era area who seem very interested in Daenerys. So whatever rituals they do to bring her to, to life as a Zora High might tie into the sort of thing Visenya was doing here. But that's definitely what that made me think of, is that, that last Dany chapter in Game of Thrones when she's making that comparison. Nice catch. I hadn't thought about that, the, her fire marriage. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting things that, like, almost I've, I've, I've started to try to get into the habit of Anytime we're presented something from the ice side, I wonder about its fire parallel and maybe there, if there is one and vice versa. And um, sometimes that really pays off. Quinn, did you have any thoughts on uh, Visenya's um, marriage powers? For lack um, of a better well, word? <laughs> I mean, the only thing is, like, like they say, um, Valyrian magic was rooted in fire and blood. So, I mean, I tend to think that it might have had... Um, I mean, it, it, like, like you said, a marriage is... Like, Kind of a some kind of arcane element to it, but you can't say for sure. Right on. Okay. Um, well, apparently I missed a I missed a super chat while all throughout all that. Oh, <laughs> now I see. Okay. Well, one recurring thing we do here on History of Westeros podcast. I think I can't recall if we've had Emma do this before. If not, if you have Emma, you get to do it again. So we have a tradition where we have people say Irish. I I see. I can't even do it. Irish wristwatch. <laughs> because it's really hard to say. So, Gemma, you being the closest physically <laughs> to Ireland, <laughs> you get to start. <laughs> Irish wristwatch. <laughs> see how hard that is. <laughs> I had to really get my teeth around that, and I'm I, I enunciate quite well in general. So you do, yeah, that... <laughs> but that's a hard phrase. <laughs> it, it was. It was. <laughs> All right, uh, Quinn. Up to you. Can you do it? <laughs> we'll see. Irish watch. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. And and Emmett, <laughs> right, I'm gonna get my jaw loose here. <laughs> Limbro. <laughs> Irish wrist watch. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, nice job. Yes, well, a, thank a, you. a fine tradition it is. Um, okay, so. I think um, I, unless there were some other questions about Visenya and Magor, I'm going to, I'll, we can go ahead and move on. I think most of this episode we can spend talking about Erea, but we want to get it built up to Erea. I think that's by itself. We probably could do a whole episode just talking about her and all the fallout from what that means for A Song of Ice and Fire. But <clears throat> we'll stay somewhat chronological here. So before we move on, is that, did anyone else have anything else on Magor or Visenya? I'm sure we'll have more later, you know, as we think about the book more. But as far as right now goes, this isn't, we're not sealing this up forever. I'd, I'd just like to add, I, I actually think um, we, we've, we've kind of looked at the possibility that neither Aenys or Magor were Aegon's sons. Um, I actually think if only one of them was, it's probably more likely to be Magor. And this doesn't negate the black magic theory. This, this could have been achieved in rather nefarious ways, um, let's say. But I think one thing that comes out of this book is how faithful the senior was to 
Aegon. Um, and, and Aegon, to her, her sister withstanding, um, he was offered wives, multiple wives, and he rejected them all even after Rhaenys died. And then when Maegor took the crown, um, Visenya said, I, I think the quote was something that, that he had come to be their king, uh, a true king, a blood of Aegon the Conqueror. She was very vehement to suggest that she was faithful. Maegor was the blood of Aegon the Conqueror. She didn't say the son, she said the blood, hmm. which I think is perhaps rather telling. That is pretty telling. Also, you know, if if she did believe, you know, talking about whether or not she had anything to do with helping Aenys uh, shuffle off this mortal coil, whether she poisoned him or helped him die in any way like that, if she truly believed that uh, her sister had cheated on their husband, then yeah. she in her mind would think that Aenys didn't deserve to be king. It's not necessarily a power play in that she believes her son is more deserving. It could be. I mean, it absolutely could be. But it could also be she suspects or outright knows that it's not. And that would, you know, who knows what people... Will, we've seen what people will do when they think the king isn't really the king. That's come up a bunch of times. It's the, the basis to the beginning of the novels with Joffrey and Stannis. And then we have the same thing with Dance of the Dragons. So there you go. That's a good take. A lot of possibilities there. Um, Connie Super in the chat says that she got DNA from Aegon's hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> That's definitely how that works. Yeah. Wasn't that how, yeah. Isn't that how they did? Um, wasn't that in G.I. Joe when they made Serpentor? They got like the DNA from eight different were like there was like Genghis Khan and Alexander the Great and they went around all the tombs that was some fun stuff back when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a super chat from Thomas Pappas he says was Megor brought to life back to life like Gregor so I think did you guys touch on that while I was uh, fixing our while well, Shay and I were fixing our issues or did, did that did we skip that? I think we brushed over it kind of quickly yeah. I don't think we got into the Gregor comparison really. Okay, well, I did. Um, I, I have started with these live streams. I wanted to do a twice an episode uh, parallel lives uh, installment. And since I meant to do Megor Gregor last week, and I kind of goofed and accidentally grabbed the Megor Aim or sorry, Gregor Aemond Targaryen comparison, which heck, you could probably do Megor Aemond also. This is like a triangle. Uh, so I wanted to draw your attention to just how similar they are. They're maybe even more similar than some people would have realized um, because. Well, I think some of the, the comparisons are pretty straightforward. Even the name, you have Megor and Gregor, right? That's pretty straightforward. Both of them were really strong at an early age. Both of them were knighted unusually young. Uh, Megor was huge. Gregor is, shall we say, huger. Uh, both were cruel, suspicious, uh, prone to torture. They, had, they didn't really have friends. Gregor killed a horse at a tournament. Magor, one of the anecdotes about Magor's early life is killing a horse with a, you know, uh, that, that like kicked him or something. And then he killed the stable boy when the stable boy came running. Uh, then we have a famous trial by combat that they were both in. Magor, with, uh, this is getting into Tommy's question here. Um, they both fight in a famous trial by combat. Gregor, of course, dies, but doesn't really die, comes back. It's not clear whether he was raised from the dead. I guess it was, it's pretty clear he was raised from the dead. I guess he was dead. If your head's cut off, you're probably dead. Um, <laughs> Magor is insensate for a month and then recovers once Tiana gets involved. Basically, once the, the practitioner of, of magic gets involved, then he wakes up. Like, hmm. And being out for 28 days... You know, that's pretty serious. That's going to change you. And he was already pretty terrible to begin with. Then you have both of them being a kinslayer. You have, because Gregor probably killed his sister and or his father and tried to kill his brother. Magor killed two of his nephews. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Both of them, now we have Mag Gregor um, was born with these blinding migraine headaches, which is kind of related, to, kind of a parallel to, to Magor having a massive head wound. Then we have their wives, both killing wives. Gregor killed one or both of his wives. Magor outlived f most of his wives. Was it four of them? I, forget. I think I have, I have five written here, but I know that's wrong. And then we may have another trial by combat with Gregor against the Faith, which is what Magor's was. So, uh, and then Magor spending his career fighting the Faith militant. And finally, as if this wasn't enough, we have both of them having sex with lots and lots of women and not really having kids. I don't know if you would count what Magor produced as... You can technically say those were kids, but, you know, we could say no kids. <laughs> so, uh, now, a lot, of, a lot of the thing, one of these things, a lot, a lot of times these parallel lives, they kind of 
lead us to the fate of the modern character by looking at the historical character. Now, Gregor's fate is kind of interesting because he's already dead. Um, Magor's death is a mystery. We know what killed him, but not who or why or what. You know, the throne, he was found with blades piercing him. So what do you guys think? Does this change? Does learning about Magor's death, does it change what you think is coming for Gregor? Or is it just too mysterious? Do we just not know enough? Or maybe a third way to put it, is Gregor's death just so well foreshadowed or set up that we don't need anything else to tell us what's coming? Um, or something else. Maybe none of my none of my ors, or maybe you guys have something entirely uh, else. Uh, Gemma, go ahead. Tell us what you think. Um, yeah, it's a really tricky one. I'm not really sure because, like you said, uh, Gregor's dead. So <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not it's not a, a cut and shut deal. This one is it. Um, I, I really enjoyed your parallels, though. I, I picked up on a few, but certainly not as many as you had. Um, I got a few Joffrey Baratheon vibes as well from some of the descriptions of him being younger, especially the incident with the cat um, when he was given a sword when he was three and the first thing he did was butcher this cat. This could be fake news. Um, the Gildane does suggest that this might be an exaggerated story, but then this would make Magor this disgustingly delicious combination of Joffrey and... Gregor Clegane, which is just horrifying, isn't it? <laughs> what a combo. <laughs> yeah. What strikes me about Magor and Gregor is that they're two of the villains who don't seem to have anything resembling a relatable human motivation. Like, <laughs> yeah. Gre Gregor is just a monster. Gregor is just Bluebeard. He's something out of fairy tales. He's not, I mean, I hate Tywin, but Tywin has understandable human motivations you can lay out in bullet points. Gregor does not. Gregor just seems like a pet of Tywin's. And Magor kind of has that same aspect where, sure, you can say he's trying to cement Targaryen rule or restore rule by the sword, but really he just seems to want to hurt everybody as much as he possibly can for no particular reason other than he's been unleashed and that's what he does. So he seems kind of like a pawn of Visenya, the real human being in this scenario, and the same way that Gregor seems like the pawn of Tywin, the real human being in this scenario. I know Martin has a reputation for wanting to create great characters, and that's largely true, but there are definitely exceptions to the rule that he creates specifically to stand out from that environment. Someone like Gregor or the Bloody Mummers don't really have much nuance to them. They're basically there just to burn through things and have more nuanced characters react to them. So I think that's something that Gregor and Magor both have in common. Cool. Well Mag said. Yeah. Well, Magor and Gregor both enjoy cruelty. They, But as far as Magor, I, th I get the sense that Magor was kind of like doomed. That's why that's why I really do think that Vicinia used some kind of black magic to kind of birth him. Because the circumstances of his death, he died on the throne. It's like it's kind of like symbolic for like the realm itself stepping up and being like, it's time to kill you. Like the throne itself killed him. Hmm. So it's kind of like you don't belong here. It's like, yeah. So that's the way I see it. You can't sit with us. <laughs> <laughs> not saying that other cruel people haven't sat the throne but maybe there was something specific about Magor. yeah that makes a lot it of is, sense that's, that's a good point go ahead Emmett it isn't it is interesting if Magor killed himself at the end which is the most realistic explanation not necessarily saying that's the correct one but it's the most kind of grounded one mm -hmm. that is an active agency that Gregor really doesn't possess anymore like whatever Robert Strong is he's not exactly Gregor Clegane so he's he's kind of out of the realm of that. But would, I would be interested to see if, like in Robert Strong's final moments, some like dim agency came back into his eyes as like Gregor somehow realizes what's been done to him. Like that's the closest you're ever going to get to humanizing the dude, I think. So hmm. uh, we'll, we'll we'll see if he gets that kind of final moment to to want to die before the end. What which theories do you guys favor? I'm with you, Emmett. I favor the he killed himself because he didn't want to lose. Like he saw the walls closing in, everyone was against him. He was definitely going to lose, and he may as well. He could either go out fighting or just go out on his own, and and that way he could he could say that nobody actually beat him. Um, the pride thing, maybe. But I, I'm but I'm not like super confident in that. Do you, does Emmett or I'm sorry, uh, Quinn or Gemma? Do you have a different take on them? I like Make to think that he just like slipped and was like. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Hey, that's what happened I, with I Viserys, know, right? He slipped. Himself. Like he, he just seemed like such a like prideful guy, kind of. So I just, I don't know. I feel like it would be like if he had kind of like a Tywin kind of like humiliating thing. Mm. Like, uh, slip and fall, now I'm dead. 
I kind of agree with the pride thing. That is a, a bit of a, a a roach in the in the theory there. Um, a roach in the theory? What the hell did I just say? Anyway, you guys know what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I think if we bring this back round to the potential of magic, we talked earlier on um, about Visenya doing this kind of trade life force trade off yeah. thing. Um, when Visenya died, Magor's story just took an absolute nosedive it was like it was like he, he could not cope um and i think the day before or the yeah the day before he was discovered on the throne he was said to be like kind of drunk and a bit dazed and confused which was very uncharacteristic um for magor so perhaps th there's an element of what you were saying that he did it himself but it was out of hopelessness because his mother was gone he could feel himself fading now he didn't have her life force to draw upon i mean i'm i'm getting a bit tinfoilery there but we are talking about magic so i'm i'm trying to sort of figure out if there was a potentially magical method of death and maybe sort of indirectly there was i i think so i think i definitely think it has something to do with the kind of trade the deal that vicinia made in order to give birth to him that led to his eventual death fall like I, I felt like he was doomed from the very beginning well it might not have necessarily been a trade-off for his birth but a trade-off for when he awoke from his coma because tiana uh, had a yeah. single conversation with visenya and visenya immediately allowed this complete stranger to take over the entire entirety of her son's care and then later it's said that visenya didn't like tiana well, she liked her enough to trust her with her son's <laughs> life. So what, mm. what's going on there? So maybe Tiana did something Some that Visenya later regretted. It's a good possibility. Yeah, there's there's definitely going to be more thinking needed for these things. There's probably some some parallels and some like... One thing George liked to do, and this is the kind of thing that the fandom f figures out later in the game. We, 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 we First thing we do is we catch the... The details, kind of the, this de detail is the same as this detail for this other character. These things that you can do word searches for. Eventually, we start to catch things that are a little harder, like similar language is being used. Or like very specific, unique phrasing. Things like that, that you can't necessarily do a strict one-on-one, -on -one, like a, a Song of Ice and Fire search for. And that's when we start to really find like more hidden, subtle you know, parallels or things like that. A um, couple of super chats here. We have um, Stannis Baratheon asks, how long was magic truly gone? Well, I guess it wasn't truly gone. We have some incidences of, of minor magic. Um, the, it's not, and it's not entirely clear when the others woke up, if we want to use the term woke up. Because we know it was before the comet was seen. Because the mm -hmm. prologue is before the comet. And the prologue, obviously, there's others walking around. Um, so I would guess, in terms of how long the dragons were gone that's roughly 141 years <laughs> we have like 157 i think was the year the last dragon died that we know of and then danny's dragons hatch at 298 uh so roughly then but again there was still some kind of magic melisandre did a few things before the you know was was apparently had some some power and there's some people in the east uh, do you guys have some different takes on that? Is there any other examples I, of magic or anything like that? Yeah. I don't think magic ever left. I don't think the children of the forest ever lost their magic. And Bloodraven obviously had magic this entire time. So, yeah, I think it probably got weaker. Like, it, but And I don't even know if it was the dragons that brought back magic or a combination of the dragons and the comet. Or if it was just like a natural thing that just happens based on the way their world works. It's working on some kind of cycle. Like it goes in phases in and out. Uh, but yeah, what you said about the we, us not knowing when the others came back, um, I would assume they had to be active for at least a f several decades because Craster was giving his children to somebody, right? Ooh, good so, point. But yeah. So yeah, so maybe waning but not gone. It's like like yeah. the seasons themselves. Yeah, I mean, the, that's one of the weird things about the others is that for a lot of the series, they don't seem to be acting with any particular urgency. Mm -hmm. Like they're not attacking the wall. They're not attacking the Night's Watch, except for when the Night's Watch gets beyond the wall. They might be searching for the Horn of Winter or some other way to bring down the wall, but that's not anywhere close to explicitly confirmed in the text. So while we feel it's the others coming back in the prologue to A Game of Thrones, for all we know, that's been basically the norm, as Quinn said, for the last few decades. Maybe they come to way more specifically for their own reasons. This is something a lot of people have, have talked about. But yeah, in terms of 
magic coming back. It definitely seems like the dragons were a particular spark for sending ripple effects of magic across the world, but there's a lot of clear evidence that magic was still present before then. Well said. Another, I, I'm, oh, go I'm ahead, Jim, I'm sorry. Same vein. Sorry, no, I'm just, I, I just agree. I can't really add much more to that. I'm, I'm pretty much on exactly the same vein as that. Right on. Okay, um, next question is from, or not a question, from Zoom, Zoom, uh, with O's and then U's. I believe that Anis was Aegon's son, but he was more like his mother, and perhaps Pisenia was jealous of Aegon's love for Anis. Well, that is certainly possible. Um, we do know that Rhaenys got all the attention, relatively speaking, 10 to 1 is what we're told as far as night spent with her. Uh, we don't really hear that Visenya was jealous, though. It's certainly possible. I mean, no one would be surprised, given what we've said. But it's, I don't know that there's a lot of overt sign of her being jealous. It's certainly, again, it's possible. But, I, but I, I'm a little dubious because... She seemed to have coexisted in the situation without other incidences of jealousy, at least not that I can think of. What do you guys think? Can you can you think of any incidences of her being jealous, or do you suspect I, that maybe? I think she might have started to become je jealous after uh, her sister's son was born, hmm. uh, because then she's like, "Oh, now now her son gets to be the heir." So I think at that point she might have become jealous. But I I think that their relationship, it like her the relationship between Aegon and Visenya, he needed Visenya. I think more than he needed Rainey's. Like he, he loved Rainey's more, but he needed Visenya. Like I think about that moment when she was telling him that he needed more guards and he was like, what are you talking about? I don't need guards. And then she cuts him with, with the sword and he's like, yeah, you do. Because she, <laughs> she was the one that would put him in his place and would check him. So I think that, yeah, I think the jealousy was something that happened later on. That can make sense because if she wasn't jealous of the of their relationship, she may have been jealous of the power dynamic. Yeah, like of of well, at least my kid will be ahead of her kid is maybe what she was thinking. Well, he loves her more, but I'm first. But then she wasn't first. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I could see that. Gemma or Emmett, you guys have. Oh, I could kind of make that one. It's like Gemmet. We can make that into one. <laughs> no, 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 I completely agree with him there. <laughs> nothing, nothing much to add beyond that. Cool. Yeah, oh. same. Same. <laughs> all right. Well, let's move on then. I think that'll do it for Magor, Anis, and uh, all them. We'll come back to them some other time um, as we, as the fandom circles back and discovers new things to discuss with regards to them. I'm sure there'll be more fun things coming up. So let's go on to Alisand Targaryen, which is kind of interesting because there's not a lot of magic to do with her. But I wanted to bring it up because early in the book, it's mentioned... Uh, that she was really into it. She was. Gr it, it, there's a mention of her just being weaned on pages of of Valyrian text. Like she was really into it, but it's not really followed up on that much later in life. Um, so one one thing I wanted to ask uh, both my guests and you all in the chat is: there maybe some missing things? Is there is there anything that maybe subtle language that was used that that would indicate more of her knowledge in this regard, or just general thoughts on that? And why it was brought, why George wrote Alisand being interested in in higher mysteries, only to have it kind of seem to fade, or maybe. The, but so yeah, um, well, uh, let's do maybe. a different order. So let's start with Quinn this time. What do you think? Maybe to point out that dragons can't cross the wall for some reason, or are unwilling mm. to, or like fire made flesh. They are like kind of like the physical embodiment of fire. And we talk about like the heart of winter or whatever being up there. That's what Bran sees in the Game of Thrones. He sees the heart of winter and he tears freeze on his cheeks. So then dragons are inherently magical. Whatever that is, is probably inherently magical. Maybe there's just something about their nature that they just reject that place. There's an aura there. They're just like, nope, not going there. That's not for me. And so it's like, no, I'm not going there. I, maybe he was, maybe it was specifically to show us that moment. Because, you know, we, we had in the TV show dragons flying beyond the wall and it's just like whatever but like maybe it was specifically for that i don't know hmm. okay yeah that's possible uh what do you got what about you emmett what do you think alisan being interested in the higher mysteries only for it not to really pay out reminds me kind of of what maester lewin talks about about how he started off being really interested in the higher mysteries and was kind of convinced they didn't exist anymore or only existed in dreams and so when you see Alisan, like, you know, noting that Silverwing can't cross the wall, I wonder if that sparks this previous interest that she's kind of covered up or moved on from, that she might be a disillusioned believer in the higher mysteries. That makes sense, too. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Gemma, what do you think? Um, I actually, when you raised this um, 
I did actually go back and look into look in the book and I and I scoured for something. And other than what um Emmett and Quinn have already mentioned, the silver wing unable or unwilling, whichever one it is, to cross mm-hmm. the wall. Um, I, th- I think you're essentially right. It, it is mentioned, and they even suggest that she she could have been a maester, and then later on she has her little set too with the maesters and says, I, I could have been one of you. But that's not really higher mysteries. The text seems to kind of gloss over, sort of move beyond this really quickly, and, and anyone that's heard me on my channel waffle on about the first few chapters of Fire and Blood will know that I've talked at length about... Targaryen propaganda and how Fire and Blood is clearly written from a point of view. Um, even George R. R. Martin said that he cannot vouch for Gildane's authenticity. And I think the reign of Jaehaerys and Alysanne in particular is by no means an exception from this. Um, I think perhaps Gildane has gone to such great lengths to paint Jaehaerys and Alysanne in such a good light. I mean, that is clear that it would have Potentially, if any further mention of the higher mysteries or dark arts in relation to Alison could have been a blemish on her record. So perhaps details have been left out or mm. embellished in a way that paints her in the way that Gilding clearly wanted to paint her, because this is how he, he's written the entire book. And it creates this kind of tension where the characters are kind of beyond knowing because these are accounts written by a maester who's taken his information secondhand from other sources, and then he's sprinkled in his own pile of bias into that mix. Um, perhaps he just thought, mm, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that bit out because I'm making Alessane look wonderfully amazing here, and that's probably not a good thing to talk about. I like that point a lot because we something we talked about last week in our first episode was we was we talked about how throughout this book throughout Fire and Blood there's a lot of meta with regard to how history is written and recorded and George comments on that a lot where and and puts his own takes on it within his own maesters and in world recording and so of course since we're going to be talking about Erea soon that's we get that right there we have Septon or not Septon but Grand Maester Benefer who apparently was really particular about everything recorded, but didn't write anything about Erea. So we know this is possible. Um, Quinn, did you, you had something, I think. I was going to say, in Fire and Blood, Gildane, every time he wants to, like, basically, like, she was a witch. She, she did <laughs> yeah. dark man. Like, so, that, so that's yeah, a good I point. agree with you, Joanna. That's another really excellent point. It's very rarely used when describing the men, is it? It's yeah. always used True. to describe the women. It's a it's woman's work. You Witchy know, women. <laughs> it, it, and just like in real world medieval terms, it was a really easy, cheap shot to go, oh, yes, she's a witch. Let's burn her. And that's yep. kind of the same thing that's going on, I think, in some of these cases. That's a great point. Yeah, there's several people mentioned as witches. I mean, and one or two of them, it's it's maybe a fair distinction, like Alice Rivers. But <laughs> but uh, mostly, it's just a, you're right. It's just something they 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 use to bring down a woman. Um, it's just like the combination of superstition and sexism, and it works. Yeah, it has worked. It's a tried and true method throughout history and in Game of Thrones. So people are going to keep doing it. Um, let's see. Any other takes on that? We can move on. Um, I wanted to uh, got so disorganized from the beginning of the stream here. I had a nice little shot of a couple of shots of Alisan here. Check it out. We got draft G here. Or sorry, Naomi makes art. My bad. I've misspoken. We have the middle one here from the book. And on the right, we have Sanrixian. So we got Sanrixian with uh, Silverwing there. Um, young Sil- Silverwing. A lot of great art. This, this fandom produces such wonderful things, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, that's really good. And we also have, um, I've got some more, I had a Visenya piece that I didn't get to use because we, um, you know, we're out of, out of order here, but I'll go ahead and put it up. It's from the book. Again, if you haven't picked up Fire and Blood, you get the artwork, even if you get the Kindle version. And apparently you get it even in the Audible version. There's a link available. If you purchase it on Audible, you can still get the artwork and, well, the artwork is a big draw, not just for this one, but for The World of Ice and Fire. Both of those books have really excellent art. So definitely recommend that. Um, while we're at it, you can go to historyofwesteros.com and all those different methods of purchasing Fire and Blood are there uh, in link format through Amazon, through Audible, uh, or through um, through Kindle. Well, that's, that's through Amazon as well. Anyway, 
Okay, so uh, next thing here, we have a super chat from Tracy McMillan who says, Alisan's reaction to the Night Fork caught my attention. I'd love to hear her elaborate on that. Yeah, so would we all. I wish we, I, I, I wouldn't want to say that, I don't want to complain, but I felt like I was uh, slightly disappointed there wasn't more to that story. You know, um, I was, it was left slight, sort of as a cliffhanger when we got that excerpt, and I was hoping there'd be more follow-up, but yeah, not so much, not so much. Um, I wonder if uh, we're going to get something that relates to it in the Song of Ice and Fire. Maybe in the World Winds of Winter, we'll see something that we re that reminds us of this incident with Alisan. But there is something we can talk about with relates to this, which is the the inter interplay between dragons and cold. Where this is also a good segue to talking about Erea because of what the cold did to those things inside her. So we have we have dragons. Silverwing in particular not wanting to cross the wall. We have Silverwing really hating the cold. And it seems like the language around dragons and cold uh, was boosted in, in Fire and Blood. He, George decided to talk about it a few times. Um, so let's let's open the, the floor up for that subtopic. Um, let's see. Emmett, you start this time. What did you what do you think about um, dragons and cold and, uh, well, I guess also we can talk about the others and fire. It seems right, like, right, like right now, maybe they're f fairly balanced, but maybe not. Well, one of the big questions of the series is whether we're supposed to be thinking of ice and fire as oppositional or whether we're supposed to be hoping for a synthesis. Mm -hmm. Are these forces that are inherently designed to fight each other to the death or is John's conception among other symbolic ice and fire resonances supposed to indicate some kind of peace or at least joining together between those two forces. I mean, I'm always reminded of when in the Knights of the Laughing Tree chapter in the Storm of Swords that Mira and Jojen are talking about how hate and love can be the same and ice and fire can mate and the land is one with all its flat parts and hills and mountains. So that seems to suggest that the author is pointing towards a hope that ice and fire can or do or should kind of join into one force. So when I see like a, a dragon not being able to go past the wall when I see, like, you know, the, the others flinching from frozen fire, to me that suggests, like, a problem to be solved. That That's something that has to be worked out by the end of the series. So I do think when we see stuff like Silver Ring not being able to, to go north of the wall, that's that's a tension that needs to be resolved in the main series, I think, in some fashion. Hmm. Well said. I think that the title of the series, A Song of Ice and Fire, the word song kind of implies that fire and ice have to work together because i think about it being like a harmony of two things and and then like i said earlier it's like there's like an emphasis on balance the world mm. can draw right through fire like melisandre wants like her religion wants like a summer that never ends but that would be awful a summer that would <laughs> that never ends would be terrible <laughs> just like a like darkness forever would be terrible so they they have to join together to create the balance so it's about them working together it's not it's not about the big battle it's about the harmony that's created Excellent that's the point. way i look at it yeah harmony song yeah that's a really good uh that's a really good way to put it john I mean, what about of you course, oh, oh sorry, go, ahead. go ahead no go ahead no i just wanted to say harmony could mean they both exist or they both don't exist that's the thing <laughs> like it, it either could mean like the others and the dragons we have to live in a world with both or it means we need a world without both others and dragons and we have to hope they get rid of each other so you know there's two different kinds of harmony but we'll see sorry to interrupt Gemma. And rather than me just regurgitating what you two have very beautifully put, which uh, all of the above I agree with, um, I'll look at it slightly different. Um, so it appears that the magic beyond the wall is somehow at odds with the magic of dragons. That seems to be what's going on with Silverwing's unable or unwilling. And I think that's the question. Was it unable or unwilling? Alessane's letter says refused. And I'm hoping, Aziz, I'm going to give you a little segue here that might work out quite nicely. <laughs> but could it just be that rather than magic and the opposition, that actually this was more of an indication that dragons are quite willful and do what mm. they want? Um, was Alisane more concerned about what might be beyond the wall, or was she more concerned that Silverwing had actually refused her, apparently, for the first time? Mm. Chase Valerion says that snow and ice makes uh, made Vermax ill-tempered, and we see quite clearly in Fire and Blood that dragons have their own wills and minds, don't we? 
Mm, so maybe what you're saying, um, among other things, is that the dragons may not be as obedient when they're faced with some of these um, fundamental uh, storyline <laughs> portions. Like if the if the dragons are forced to face the onset of winter, they may not uh, just sit there and toast whites all day long and maybe like, nah, I'm <laughs> flying <laughs> south. I'm getting out of here. I don't like it. <laughs> you know? I'm fair enough, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I like it. That's that's very interesting. Yeah, because because a lot of us have been sitting here, and one of the questions we get, uh, we've probably all gotten this question some way throughout our our uh, time as creators, and a lot of you guys in the chat or a chat out there have probably discussed this with your friends or or whatever. This story is so is so full of broken tropes and subverted tropes that it can't just be an epic battle between the others and dragons at the end, and then that's it. Right, so we have to have some expectations have to be subverted, and that's this is kind of what we're getting into here. We can't just have, oh yeah, the dragons are going to toast the others, melt them, and then yeah, that's it, game over. Hey, everyone's happy, you know. So yeah, so if the dragons don't work quite the way we expected them to, they're not just you know ice melting beasts, then that would really fit well with that whole yeah, we're not gonna, it's not gonna go the way we expect. Or if they were ice melting beasts, but just didn't really want to <laughs> yeah like hey we're totally capable of this but we don't want to yeah. it's like lml not a slave uh, uh, yeah a dragon uh, yeah perfect yeah and that includes and we've seen that soldiers can be slaves um and quite literally um both in in not in not in the non-literal form where we have peasants kind of forced to go march and become soldiers and get nothing for it it's a sort of slavery but not called that and then we have literal slave soldiers like the unsullied and the guys on stilts <laughs> it's all all versions of that the embarrassing ones and the amazing ones so okay um i think that is a that is a good segue we can move on to um let's talk about area and all the fallout this is also our halfway point roughly so a couple of uh quick announcements before we dive into that amazing fun stuff um let's see here i mean i gotta find my get my bearings and see what I missed from the beginning that I was supposed to announce. Oh yeah, one thing I was supposed to announce was a couple of corrections. I said at least two things wrong. That'll probably be, you know, semi-regular as this book is so new, we'll probably make the occasional mistake. I said that when I was making that mistake with the Parallel Lives tweet last time, I, I mentioned that uh, Magor never took Heron Hall. That one doesn't work. Magor definitely took Heron Hall. Um, he's the one who killed all the Strongs off, basically, so... Whoops. And then I accidentally said that Damon's wife was Rhea, was Ama Aaron, and that's uh, that's Viserys' wife, his brother. That's the mother of Rhaenyra. Damon's wife was Rhea Royce. Interestingly, there's a mistake with Damon in the book itself. There's one point where the book says that Bela Targaryen and Rhea, uh, and Rhaena were born from um, Damon's first wife. Rhea, which is, of course, not correct. That was his second wife, Lena. So even the book got some of these things wrong. If we're going to get it wrong, hey, we get to be forgiven. Because if the book can't even keep it straight, then we get to make a few mistakes too. Um, a couple of shout-outs. I'm going to give a shout-out to our History of Westeros' first sword. That's Jeff Gnarly, the Long Snapper, And a couple of our Dragon Rider patrons who normally are announced at the beginning of the episode. But hey, things got all discombobulated here. Thanks to... Talanis the Talon, a king of Gagasos, rider of Talarius, a red dragon with scales, horns, and talons of midnight black. And also thanks to Robert the Fourth of House Ardeacor, burned king of Blazewater Bay, rider of Atroxus, a black dragon with bioluminescent spots with smoldering embers and a banded blue tail. Also want to give shout outs to our blood riders. We have Vorsaki, wielder of a Valyrian steel arak with a dragon bone hilt. Koholkoi, called Sun Piercer, wielder of a Dragonbone Bow. Quakavo, the Tamer, wielder of, a, of the Wildfire Whip Gehenna, a new member of the Blood Riders. And it is time to give a shout out to our Sellsword Captains. That includes, uh, I'm sorry, wait. Yeah. <laughs> that is right. We have our, wait, I did the Sellsword Captains last week, didn't I? Yeah. It's time for the Ironborn Captains. Kathleen the Ruthless, Captain of the Night Terror, motto Don't Fall Asleep. Black Matto Storm Rider, Captain of the Rusted Hinge. Tusk Shield, Breaker Captain of Kraken's Fury. Oisan the Wanderer, Captain of Naga's Living Flame. 
Sir Selvas Red Blaze of White Harbor. I'm sorry, Red Blade of White Harbor, Captain of Trident of the North. Lord Chuck Laws is Captain of the Dromon Nightblood, Destroyer of Evil. Heron Burntbeard is Captain of the Smoking Narwhal. John Gregor is Captain of the Fist of the Drowned God. Carice Farwind is called Seal Speakers, Oracle of Lonely Night, Lordly Light, the Eyes in the Waves. Sir Kiron of Lonely Light is Scourge of the Sunset Sea, Captain of Naga's Breath, a Droman armed with siphons of wildfire. Aileen is Archer Queen, Captain of the Border Collie. Crimson Kate is Captain of the Drowned Queen's Vengeance. Jasana the Just is Collector of Tolls, Captain of the Golden Gift. And Lord Mitch of House Bailey is Captain of Widow's Blood. His heir is Lordling Mason of House Bailey. All right. Uh, super chat from Bernie the Burnt, who says, tight panel tonight, thumbs up, happy Festivus. All right, thanks. Happy Festivus to you as well, Bernie. Appreciate that. Bernie is a standout and always appearing in a lot of different chat rooms for different live streams. Also, shout out to some of the other creators in the uh, chat there. I see Eliana. I see LML. Indeep Geek was in there earlier. And I'm probably missed some other people. I haven't been able to pay enough, much attention to the chat. Without a Shay here, I have to uh, focus on so many other things. So hopefully I didn't miss anybody else, but um, I'll try to keep an eye out for you here in the second half. All right, that is that is our announcements for the first half. Well, let's get going with Araya. Um, this is quite a story. Probably the thing we've gotten the most questions on so far. It's also fairly early in the book. So I suspect we'll be getting questions on other things that are pretty amazing things that happen later in the book as well. But as far as early book stuff, this is probably the most standout story. Um, not just because it's amazing and because it's really well written and chilling, but also because it had, does have quite a lot to, uh, in terms of its possible impact on a number of storylines and characters. Our patron supporter, uh, Westerosi, um, our, my new term I'm trying to use is Westorians. Westorian Stephanie the Peerless, Dwarf of the Lowlands, says, Every time someone brings up Area and what happened to her, I literally start itching. I'm itching now. <laughs> so, let's start with, um, who haven't we started with? Quinn, we'll start with you this time. We had the quick, brief story of, we'll start with the very simplest thing. Early on, Rayella and Area were switched at birth. Mm -hmm. well, not at birth, but at some point. Yeah. Does that matter to this part of the story? Is that uh, is that symbolic? Is that foreshadowy? Or is that just kind of um, an interesting part of the story that that helped George riff on uh, the dynasty situation? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure if that matters in any way. I could be wrong. Uh, yeah, Jim, Jim probably has a better answer than me because I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> nice cat back there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a dog. Oh, is it? Oh, my goodness. Oh, you're right. <laughs> of course you're right. <laughs> no, you're wrong. You don't know what your own animal is. Close look like It looked like a cat from that light. That's cool. Okay, nice nice cat dog there. <laughs> anyway, sorry for the interruption, the animal interruption. Go ahead, Gemma. Um, I think initially the issue of succession was the reason for the twin swap. The OG Araya was the youngest. Um, she was Rayella. Um, she was, I think it's quite clear, one was timid, one was bolshy. The, the swap itself, I don't think is in contest. Um, even Rogar Baratheon knew about it. But I think the reason why it has later future implications for what we're about to get in is it was her very nature, her strong-willed nature that proved her undoing because it was that streak of her personality that gave her the hubris to select Beleriand the Black Dread as her would-be dragon in the first instance. That's a good point. That is a good point, yeah. Um, Emma, what about you? Yeah, I think Gemma just pretty much nailed it there. I do, you know, it's obviously a kind of nod to the troubles with dynasty and switched princes and princesses in real life, but yeah, I think it's more kind of a, a lead into the magical story than it is directly connected, I think. Cool. Okay, so let's review real quick what actually happened. So make sure we have our details as straight as possible, and then we'll get into the meat of the story. What happens is Reyna, who is the mother of Erea, uh, the queen in the West is her name, and then eventually she's queen of the... I guess she's queen in the East at this point, her nickname, because she's living on Dragonstone when this happens. Erea wants to leave Dragonstone. She's not happy there. She liked living and... At uh, at court, it's it's a little Sansa ish and a little Arya ish, maybe more Arya ish. But this part part reminds me of Sansa not wanting to be at court where all the action is. 
Now she bonds with the dragons. She's not completely lonely, but she, when Alisanne comes one day and she talks to Alisanne and says, Hey, get me out of here. I want to leave. And this is actually right after Alyssa dies. So uh, Alisanne and Raina's mother and Raina misses it by a little bit. And, um, then Araya, Alisanne brings this up to Raina, says, hey, Araya wants to come back to court. Can I bring her? And she's like, takes it really personally. He's like, no, like, you've taken everything. You get, you get my crown. You get my this. You get my that. You can't have her also. Even though this is, a, you know, this is a possession thing. Like, Araya is a girl. She, you know, she's a person, not a possession, right? But Raina gets her way. Araya gets mad. About, and Raina confronts Araya about this. Like, you wanted to leave or something like that. This happens off screen. Araya, they have an argument. Next thing we know, Araya has jumped on Balerion and left. And then she's gone for over a year. A little more background on Araya because there's some parallels to Arya here. The name, of course, is there. Uh, from 8 to 10, Araya lived in the stables in disguise from ages 8 to 10. Uh, Arya really liked working in the stables too. And Araya, in fact, it said that it was just the happiest she ever was. Not that she had a whole long life full of time time to build up happy memories you know she died around age 13 so or a little a little before that and of course there's a lot to be said about dragon bonding we can get into all that but she wasn't bonded with Balerion, but she was spending a lot of time with all these different dragons she was just hanging out with the dragons she just liked it and uh yeah so um barth speculates that she didn't have any control over where Balerion went and um yeah okay let's just get into it there's so many different ways we can approach this Let's start, uh, Gemma, we'll start with you this time. We'll start with the, do you, do we believe, for the, one of the basic questions, do we believe that Barth is accurate, or is right, that she went to Valyria? We'll start with that, because if she didn't go to Valyria, then we've got all these other questions to answer. If we assume that she did go to Valyria, then we can kind of work, with, work within that framework. And, and one more thing, this was right near the end of the year 54, and she's gone for a little over a year and comes back like early the year 56, if I got that right. So anyway... Gemma, go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm with Bath. I, I actually, I mean, I know I talked about propaganda and points of view and, and fake news and, and all of these, you know, things that we have to take into account. But I actually take a lot of stock in what Bath says. I mean, his uh, dragons, worms and wyverns kind of won me over. But I, I think it's a safe bet to say that it was Valeria that she went to, but we do need to remember we don't know for 100% that this was the case, because obviously Valerian can't talk. It could have been a shy, it could have been somewhere sketchy in Sothrios, it could have been Stigai or anywhere on those crazy maps where George started just making up names <laughs> and stealing them from H.P. Lovecraft when he got Tough but fair. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would go with Valeria. There is much, there's a lot in the text to suggest that was the case. Um, for starters, the parallels with Drogon going back to the Dothraki Sea to where his, essentially he was born, we, we assume. Um, so the same would have happened to Valerion that he went back to where he was hatched, which was Valeria. He was the only dragon left that was born in Valeria. True that. Um, other takes? Emmett or Quinn? Um, yeah. I th oh, sorry. Go ahead, Quinn. You go ahead. You go okay. Um, yeah, I think to compare it to Euron's claim to having been to Valyria, which we'll get into in detail in a, a little bit later, there is a narrative gain from him lying about that because it establishes that Euron is bullshitting to a certain extent and trying to impress the Ironborn and wants to get them on his side. I don't get what the narrative gain for his readers would be from this not being Valyria. Like, Barth thinks it was Valyria, but we're generally inclined to trust Septon Barth, so I don't see what would be the benefit from it not being Valyria. I, I think that's the it's the real deal, and we're supposed to take this as very representative of what happens when you go to Valyria. And yeah, I completely agree with Gemma that I think it was just Valyrian's homing signal, which just adds to the kind of poignancy of this, that it wasn't even the rapscallion Targaryen kid choosing to run off on her own, that to a large degree she wasn't even in control. And for all we know, she regretted it very shortly after she started on this journey, but she just wasn't in command anymore, which I think gets at the relationship between Targaryens and their dragons we were talking about earlier, that we might think of the dragons as just WMDs, as just tools, as weapons, but they have a will of their own, and it's hard for even Targaryens to wrestle with them. Yeah. So, yeah, this was my second favorite part of the book, other than the Kraken part later on. But, <laughs> yeah, I think she went to Valyria, 
And of course she couldn't control Bolari on the Black Dread. Daenerys raised Drogon, and she can't even control him. What makes you think that Arya Targaryen can control Bolari on the Black Dread? Drogon just took Daenerys back to where he was already going, back to his like little nest. So yeah. I think like it is not a slave. And yeah, I, I think I def I I'm pretty sure that it was Valeria. I can't say that I'm definitely sure, but I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure it was Valeria. Cool. All right. So we're all agreed on that. I also agree. I, I think Emmett's point is, is very strong that why it's just too many layers of if it was if, if George was lying to us, it'd be too many. It'd be a little silly. Too many layers of, of, of trust for us to get around. Like we're supposed to trust Barth for the most part. We're supposed to trust this these details and everything like that. So um, if we think about the logistics of this flight, we assume she went to Valyria. That would be, that is a really long flight. And we're also, it's even mentioned in the book earlier that Alisande says dragons can't just fly forever. You got to land somewhere. Um, so that could, that creates the possibility for some really interesting, say, dragon one night stands in, say, the Disputed Lands. Or, you know, I, I looked at the map and if you just draw a kind of a straight line from, you can almost do it behind me if you look at the map behind me, you can draw a straight line from the tip of Massey's Hook there because it's hard to see Dragonstone, but they're they're pretty close. Just do a straight line there to, to Valyria and you're going to pass through the Disputed Lands and just south of the Rhoyne. And there's just a lot of areas in there, so some people might have seen Valeria, a Valerian uh, pass by, and that could be neat. But if you think about um, what Quinn brought up is... Drogon and Drogon is our, is a huge parallel here not only because they're the the main dragon the, and it's a black dragon but we get all these parallel examples we even get during Barth's retelling of this story we even get mention of uh, a pit fight we even hear about a wyvern in that's in you know that was in a pit fight and we're like is this Balerion like nah he brings it up to dismiss it but the fact that he even mentions that is like Pretty clear reference to Drogon and Dasnax Pit. And there's a couple of sneaky things going on there that I want to bring up and have you guys discuss. First of all, like Quinn said, Danny can't control uh, Drogon. He goes home. The homing signal to he goes back to the Dothraki Sea. And so we have now at least three examples of a dragon kind of using this homing signal. We have Drogon, we have Balerion, and we also have Sunfire. Uh, Sunfire, of course, was on Rook's Rest and flew back to Dragonstone, uh, which, you know, is a whole different story all of itself. But what I want to bring up here is, is, is something else that was touched on, too, is the, 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 the milder version of mind melding that happens with dragons and people. It's, not, it's nothing like the skin changer bond, but there's definitely something going on. And I think this example, both of with Erea, the timing of Erea's flight and the fact that she was really angry and if there's any, if Drogon maybe felt this, because the fact that Drogon just decided to take off and head home is interesting, the, you know, because other riders flew Balerion and this didn't happen. Did Viserys, King Viserys, have any issue like that? No, Balerion was old and, and wounded and just sat down. Megor didn't have this issue. Megor flew Balerion to Pentos. None of this stuff happened. So something was different here and it may have been the emotional connection we also have all these stories of the dragons of the blacks and greens kind of snapping at each other we have Dreamfire coming in hot when she's found out that her mother is uh, when reyna finds out that her mother's dead and vagar i believe it is or one of the other dragons Rea or silverwing maybe reacts to sensing this, this coming of this dragon so there's all sorts of little tidbits to me this leads up to the notion that Drogon heard the blood and and commotion at Dasnak's pit to me has always been a decent enough explanation, but not enough, not a, not fully satisfactory. Because look where he lives; he lives way the hell out on the Dothraki Sea. How is he gonna smell this situation from that far away? Danny got really, really, really upset at Dasnak's pit. Both she hated it ethically, she hated it physically, she hated it just completely. Like it was making her vomit, it made her sick, she was overheated. So I wonder if that wasn't why, partly why Drogon appeared. So I want to start with this whole bond, dragon bonding discussion as we work into some of the other details of, of Valyria itself. Anyone have any takes on on that as far as that goes? I know I, I sat on that soapbox for a minute there. <laughs> yeah, there's... Well, let's go with Quinn first this time. There's there's some evidence, evidence for it in, a, in, a, in the uh, um, 
Daenerys with Daenerys and Drogon. It's like Drogon screams when Daenerys has an orgasm. He protects her in the house of the Aang. Um, so yeah, he. I think I think there is definitely a connection. There's a bonding. Like you said, it's not like she's literally going into his mind like with a warg. But yeah, there is definitely kind of a mental connection. And the Targaryens have the blood of the dragon. I don't know if that's related to why. I think it had something to do with whatever the Balerians did in the day to gain the initial control of the dragons. I think that is something that like affected their bloodlines from that point on. And yeah, I think there I think it's something that's I guess genetic, I would say. Yeah, I think so too. There's something in there. The whole this whole chimera thing that we'll we'll be touching on also. But um let's let everybody else weigh on in this real quick before we touch on that. So uh, Emmett, go ahead. Yeah, I think it's worth noting the connection, I think, between what happens with Daenerys and Drogon and what happens with these other dragon home example is that longing for home. Like what Daenerys is feeling at the end of a dance with dragons, the distaste and hatred that lures Drogon to her, as you're suggesting, is her feeling that Marine is not her home after all. That's kind of her ultimate revelation in dance with dragons, that this isn't where she belongs, that she needs to leave for better or for worse. And you have that sense with the Targaryens as a whole, that as much as they conquered Westeros and made themselves the top dogs there, their home, Valyria, was kind of destroyed. And there's always that absence there. And Daenerys always feels the absence of home, the the place with the red door or her imagined Westeros. And I think, I think that's a connection there that as powerful as the Targaryens and their dragons are, that longing for home is really strong. And I think you can see it come up in these powerful moments with Valyria and Valyria and with Drogon responding to Danny. That's a good take. Very good. Um... Real quick, let me throw in there um, before I let Gemma answer. I want to. That's we should also think about. We're as we think about what maybe triggered Valerian to fly to Valyria. We should maybe be considering what triggered the flight home, and if it was if if Araya was in such horrible shape that her mental state was just frantic, that may have been what maybe gave her some measure of control over Valerian at last. I mean, they were gone for over a year, so maybe she sort of learned to control him a little bit in that time. Anyway. Gemma, go ahead. Um, I think the, I think the distinction is, and I think this is in the case of Danny and Araya, um, as you mentioned early on, Aziz, that um, Araya spent a lot of time with the dragons. She didn't necessarily hop on any of them and go for a flight or anything, but she certainly had enough time to build up a bond. And I think the distinction is there's a difference between having a bond and being able to bend a dragon's will to yours. Um, Danny certainly has a bond with Drogon, but getting him to do what she wants, on the other hand, are, are two very distinctive things and one that she's certainly going to have to work on. Um, and I think it's quite possible that Araya had more of a bond with Valerian than people actually gave her credit for. Um, I, I think it was clear that she was punching above her weight and she was <laughs> not doing the driving. Um, but it also appears that he stepped in, in her defense. He came back badly wounded by... Something. It, it, it's <laughs> staggering to imagine what could have possibly caused a, a wound like that. But then, and I don't think he intentionally brought her to a situation that would do her harm. And he also brought her home. And judging on the state of her, it's very possible that that was his decision to do that. So I think... There could have well been a bond, but as with Danny, actually making Valerian do what she wanted. Um, Stannis Baratheon said in the chat early on that Arya probably said, let's go home. And Valerian said, OK. <laughs> what the wrong home. communication, yeah. you know. <laughs> I was thinking King's Landing, but you were thinking Valerian. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> That's not so good. Um, yeah, so the... I want to bring up some some potential counterexamples, which I think the counterexamples actually help this case, especially if we're building, we, we seem to be building a case that an emotional turmoil within the rider may have an impact on how the dragon behaves. If we look at some of these other cases of dragons that didn't go home, like Silverwing didn't go home after uh, um, Aegon, or after Aenys died. Um, there was, uh, Silverwing's example was also kind of a funny example because it was taken for granted that Aegon the Uncrowned could just walk right in and grab him. I'm going to sneak into King's Landing, sit on that dragon and fly him on out of there. There was no question that this would work. And then Dreamfire, another example, when, when, um, after the Dance of the Dragons, Dreamfire is 
still alive uh, and just goes off to Red Lake. Makes the new home far away from Dragonstone. The opposite direction. Red Lake is here. I'll, I've actually got a little map shot ready for, for everybody here. Um, Red Lake, it's just way, way over in the reach. I mean, it is... Look at that. It's almost on the West Coast. It's... It's kind of an odd place for, I mean, what do I know about what dragons like do think about their homes, but it's, it's, it's not at all like what we've seen. So there's, it's always, always pays to look at the, uh, you know, the other versions of behavior in similar circumstances to see if it tells us anything. Um, so, okay. So let's think about more about the actual logistics of this, of, of what would have happened. Um, and this will get us into Euron as well. Now, Okay, so she flew there. She was there. Let's say they were in Valyria. Let's say they spent the majority of this gone this year in Valyria. She has to. We know she came back emaciated, but she clearly didn't go the whole year without eating, <laughs> right? Now we get to look at Danny and and Drogon again as an example. What does Danny do? Danny's having the same problem. She's sitting there like, uh, I'm out here in the Dothraki Sea. All I got is these berries and ants to eat. You know, and then eventually she gets on Drogon and they go get a horse and she's just eating bloody half-cooked horse. Well, put put yourself in Araya's place in here. She's living in magical fallout zone land of Valyria, which I don't know about you guys. I didn't think it was physically possible to go to Valyria at all. I, I didn't know there were diseases. I just thought it was like fire and brimstone and you would just be incinerated. So clearly that was wrong. But setting that aside... What the hell did she eat? I mean, I think of Ashai and the messed up fish and the messed up rivers and the fact that, like, crops don't really grow. They have ghost grass and no kids. And I'm thinking, this is what happens if you eat that. You know, she Drogon had to kill something and then she had to eat, like, the singed remains of some crazy-ass blood magic <laughs> creature. <laughs> this is what she's feasting on. Like, I, I could... Ooh, uh, someone else needs to talk for a minute because this is like crazy thinking about that. Like, is this, is this, have you guys thought about this aspect of it? Like, what did she eat while she was there? I don't know if that's just me or if I'm just, anyway, uh, whose turn is it to go first? Gemma, I think you were last, last time. You start this time. What is, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, uh, where do we go from here? Um, <laughs> I mean, you can see how that would be, like, infected her. Like, that's how whatever got inside her, she, like, just ate it, you know, and then it hatched inside yeah. her. I don't know. Like, <laughs> when I first read it, I got these Stargate flashbacks of the Garwald. Is that that's how you pronounce it? You know, the, the, the parasitic race that uses hosts to survive. And they yeah. also look like snakes and worms, and they, they kind of burrow their way into hosts, either in the mouth or I think it's the neck as well. I think they prefer that because they don't want to look into their host's eyes as they're creepy. taking over their body. Yeah, super creepy. Um, early on in the chat, they, um, they were suggesting that we don't drink the water in Valeria, so that's a possibility. But yeah, it, it could have been, I mean, this is George R. R. Martin, it could have been something way grosser. Um, <clears throat> she could have actually eaten the creatures believing them to be dead out of desperation or she ate something that contained them while they were in their much smaller parasitic kind of form if that would make sense that, i yeah. also think that a, perhaps being targaryen gave her a degree of heat resistance not fireproof heat resistance that lent itself to her surviving perhaps far longer hmm. than somebody else had given the same circumstances. Hmm. But yeah, worms with faces and snakes <laughs> with hands. <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to take a minute after we discuss finish this part, we're going to have to take a minute to discuss the actual writing of this section because yeah. it's also like, whoa. Good job. Okay, uh, uh, who's next? Quinn, I think it's uh, your turn. Okay, well, um, yeah, I like to think that these worms that were living inside of her are kind of like a proto form of the fire worms that we hear about that were said to roam in Valyria in, in the 14 fires. So I, I kind of have, this is, this is mostly kind of just speculation, just me kind of just thinking about it. I kind of imagine that, okay, so these things probably start off as like eggs and then they have a parasite phase and then they kind of break out and then they go on and they become the, it's like it's like that kind of life cycle so if i think i think about what could have like hurt drogon as well not drogon balerion as well so i I would, I would imagine that if there were huge fireworms that still existed in valyria 
that one of those could potentially do damage. If Drogon killed it, and he started roasting it and eating it, I mean, that's the only food. Maybe she kind of ate it and ended up eating some of the eggs, got in her stomach, and... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Imagine her being on the back of Valerian while he's fighting his fire. She's like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Hold on tight. Like, imagine, like, she doesn't have a saddle, clearly. <laughs> Jesus. This is really quite a rabbit hole. <laughs> All right, Emmett. Or, yeah, go ahead. When we talk about reference points for Valyria, one of the reference points, of course, we use is just hell. I mean, Aziz, you mentioned fire and brimstone. And yeah, it's a place covered with volcanoes and ash and feels very Mordor-esque and the kind of place that would evaporate you if you set foot there. But the other comparison is a irradiated zone, somewhere a nuke has gone off. That's the other kind of common reference point for what Valyria looks like after the doom. And in that case, certainly... She couldn't have survived there long term, but she could have survived there just long enough to eat something horribly irradiated or the magical version of irradiated or contract some horrible disease that manifested itself that way. So I think she might have lasted long enough yet to eat something, but certainly something that uh, was going to have a, a horrible fruit when she got back to Westeros. <laughs> I, I do like the fruit. Idea, exactly. I do like the idea of them being a nascent form of the fireworms or some sort of like byproduct of the Valyrian experiments that produced the dragons or produced the dragon bond, that this is the, the, the kind of leftover version of that, yes. uh, I think would be interesting to tie in, especially if, again, this, the kind of poetry of her coming back on this glorious Valyrian dragon and seeing what was left over the result of the process to produce something, someone like Valyrian, that, that kind of appeals to me. That is, uh, this is, this is, uh, fits in so well with something I'm working on on the side. I'm working on a bonus episode for Gagasos, which Gagasos is like almost, was almost the 10th free city um, before it was wiped out by disease. But they were a penal colony that they experimented on people using exactly this. They had the flesh pits where they would mate beasts and humans. And Septon Barth mentions this. I grabbed the, uh, the quote here. He says, um, uh, where'd that quote go? Oh, I don't know where it is. They, he, he talks about how they, they talk about chimeras and, um, how this is, a you know, they, they basically create unnatural things. Uh, chimera is, is, has a couple different meanings. Something I'm going to get into in the episode. It's a, you know, legendarily speaking, chimera is just like a, a mash, mishmash of creatures that don't belong together, but it's also a real medical term. Um, it can cause you to have things like multiple blood types at the same time i've um, got the quote from fire and oh, great. that mentions chimeras bring it please um what befell her what befell her on valeria i cannot surmise judging from the condition in which she returned to us i do not even care to contemplate it the valerians were more that more than dragon lords they practiced blood magic and other dark arts as well delving deep into the earth for secrets best left buried and twisting the flesh of beasts and men to fashion monstrous and unnatural chimeras for these sins the gods in their wrath struck them down yeah so we were asking like Emmett you raised the question earlier this is part of why I thought about this a little bit is I think it was you Emmett anyway brought up like well what where are these things right now we have dragons and this is whether it's a, dragons are a result of engineering or not is a side question but if other creatures were engineered, for example, we know sphinxes were engineered by the Valyrians, where are they now? Well, I assume they're all just de died off because most of these creatures probably couldn't breed. But dragons can breed. They can reproduce, which is maybe something that makes them, you know, and in nature this happens too. There's apparently polar bears and grizzly bears can mate and occasionally those, their offspring can, can, uh, be are, are fertile can actually bear young of their own and even occasionally mules can be can be are, it's, it's it's commonly believed that mules are sterile but they're not always sterile so just take science and instead of science doing these things just imagine blood magic doing these things instead and it gives you all these possibilities that are amazing and creepy and and uh Here's a question we got from um, one with no name who says, I'm wondering if the creatures were some sort of chimeras as Barth speculated, that, that Valyrians were practicing black magic and perhaps gene splicing. How did those things get into her? So we talked about the possibility of her eating them or just, you know, burrowing. It could have burrowed into her while she slept. Like, where was she sleeping? Like, I have all these basic questions, you know? Like, is she sleeping on his back? You know, like... And this is, and this is all building up to us talking about Euron, so, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Um, yeah, so, uh, let's see before, what else we have to get there before that? Um, 
Oh yeah, so the the notion of um, what this might tell us about other dragons, we already have this with Drogon, right? We already have Drogon returning home. But Drogon had already established this home there. It's a little different, right? Because Drogon was returning to a home he had already made. He wasn't just like, I'm flying out into this rocky sea for the first time ever. He had already established this spot that he was taking Ganny back to. Balerion's a little different in that he's going back home for the first time in literally centuries, as far as we know. Uh, so it's a little different in that regard. Will, do you guys think this will be relevant at all to, say, Viserion or Rhaegal? Do you think that we might get... Anything to do with them, or are we just getting confirmation of what we're seeing with Drogon? Is that kind of like a pre-foreshadowing, you know, foreshadowing after the fact? What do you guys think? We'll start with uh, Emmett this time. I mean, Viserion and Rhaegal have yet to be distinguished much in their own right. The focus has overall so much been on Drogon on the series as the main dragon, as the one who represents Danny's anger and rage most clearly, as the one who left and came back and is with her now in the Dothraki Sea. So it would be certainly interesting to see an uh, event like this tailored to Viserion and Rhaegal. I wonder if we might see an inversion of it with Dragonbinder. If Dragonbinder causes one of the dragons to freak out in any way and fly somewhere, they won't be flying home under their own uh, wherewithal, but under the control of somebody else. And I'm, I've always been curious about what the dragons would mean for John in terms of his own quest for home, because the, the revelation that Rhaegar is his father kind of answers that question although it opens up a whole new slew of ones for him so maybe his connection to a dragon will somehow be related to this kind of homing beacon and, and, and dragons making for where they belong but i think i don't know if we're going to see a direct copy of that with the and regal i think we'll probably see some kind of different angle on the same theme cool quinn what do you think what do you think about that yeah i pretty much agree with what he just said i i, I yeah i don't really have anything to add if we do see some strange dragon behavior, we may be we may think of this, but it may not be something like so like a strict, you know, similar storyline. What about you, Gemma? Do you have a different take, or do you agree with them? Um, kind of. Well, I, I think it's very possible that it is foreshadowing. Um, we, you said it uh, when we first got onto this top topic. Araya's story in Fire and Blood is possibly one of the most striking standout pieces of the text, but I don't think it was just simply included as a gratuitous and uncomfortable death scene for us to all read, the, or to make Jaehaerys more interesting, his reign or whatever. Uh, there's a reason that this was included. There were, there's always a reason. Um, and I think it might tie a few things in, Danny's story. Um, and then the, the thing that stands out to me, and, and he did it in Fire and Blood, and he did it in The World of Ice and Fire, Whatever really happened that caused the doom of Valeria, it's just been glossed over so many times now to the point where it feels purposely unexplored. Um, and, and, and it could well be that there are details that concern the what the true cause of the doom that cannot be revealed at this point. Yeah, who would know, because right? Yeah. Yeah, because they're too spoilery for the main Song of Ice and Fire plot or the end game. Um, I think there's a good possibility that we will find out what happened fully to Araya in the main storyline. But, as, you know, to put it in a nutshell, a Targaryen princess riding a black dragon to Valeria definitely feels like foreshadowing to me. <laughs> I have, okay, I want to say one thing. I, okay, I wonder what would have happened if area hadn't been dumped into a tub of ice and mm. the creatures had just like naturally burst out would it have created some kind of epidemic in king's landing where everyone was Oof. just infected with like these fire creatures and then it king's landing became like a wastelander i don't know i don't know what effect it would have but i don't know yeah, yeah that's well, a good that, question like did they if they were allowed to gestate further like if they were growing yeah. you know or if they had been allowed to grow more yeah yeah <laughs> well that's an interesting question this is quite tinfoily but that opens up the possibility, what if this was a Trojan horse of some kind? What if the mm -hmm. fireworms or a force behind them are trying to infiltrate King's Landing or the Targaryens like the Whites in a game in the first book in a Game of Thrones Yikes. when they're they're sent across the wall? Again, that's 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 probably too much. Uh, I don't think there's actually a conscious it. force in Valyria <laughs> directing everything, but it, it is something that came to mind when Quinn was talking about what would happen if they hadn't discovered it right away. Well, that's a, actually also a great segue because if we want to talk about parallels to this story and what's going on in the north we do have some juicy stuff to dig into 
Um, before I do that, I want to do another uh, quick incidence of Parallel Lives, and I've got one that's a great fit for our conversation, especially with what Gemma just mentioned with regards to common uh, parallels between uh, Daenerys and her forebear, Aegon the Conqueror. This one's not really trivia because it's too straightforward. Daenerys is straight up compared to Aegon uh, many times. She's Aegon, the, Aegon with teats, I believe Tyrion calls her or something like that. Someone calls her that. And of course, there's some really obvious straightforward ones. Like she's about, she's trying to conquer Westeros like, like Aegon did. Uh, she's got a giant black dragon. She's got three dragons. Um, then we've got this multiple, then some little bit less obvious parallels like Danny gets pregnant one time and has trouble having kids in general. Yeah, that's a little something there, maybe. And uh, there's maybe a little blood magic involved in the birth of the one child she had who didn't survive. Uh, there's a little something suspicious there as well. Now, as far as foreshadowing, um, the fandom is very divided on whether or not Danny's going to survive the series. We're not going to get into that. It's a we could talk two hours about that alone. But let's just say, if Aegon's story foreshadows Danny, it's it's a feather in the cap for people who think Danny's going to live. Because if Aegon is a parallel to Danny, well, he is. If 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 this part of his story parallels Danny, then Aegon dies of old age. So that would mean maybe Danny gets to live on as well. I don't think that's too strong of a, a piece of evidence, but it matters. But I do think that something else is more interesting than that, and that is that in the in the TV show um, we have a dragon killed, and so is Meraxes killed in um, canon, right along uh, in the Hellholt. And the interesting thing about the Hellholt is she's killed in probably the hottest place in Westeros. That's you know in in the southern desert of Dorne, a place called the Hellholt. I mean, it's also got sulfuric water. I mean, it's it's really sort of like Valyria light or something. And then you have one going into the water as well. But basically, we have this con we have this this talk of maybe a dragon is killed, maybe a dragon, maybe we have maybe we have an undead dragon or an ice dragon, something like that. Well, here we go in this section about Area. What do we have when Balerion returns? Three horn blasts. <laughs> the sound of the horn was the sound of it ran down my spine like a cold knife. Though I could not have said why. Alisan says that. And this is before Alisan has gone north, by the way. So she hasn't experienced the north yet. And that phrase, cold knife, comes up a bunch of times referring to winter. John says cold knife. Tyrion says cold knife. Or knife, uh, daggers of, like, you know, related, very similar language. Several people use that exact same language. And so we have the three horn blasts and we even have this line says, wondering, the people of King's Landing were, were, were so afraid, quote, wondering if somehow Magor the Cruel had returned from beyond the grave to mount him once again. Alas, it was not a dead king, but a dying child. Alas? <laughs> Alas, it wasn't a dead king, but a dying child. Darn, it wasn't Magor. Oh, well. But check out that language. They're talking about Magor coming back from the dead, which we already talked about a little bit. We have a, a dragon with three horn blasts and a dead king riding him. Ooh, okay. That is very striking language. We got cold knife. We got three horn blasts. That is just... All right. Uh, Quinn, I think you, were, you weren't first last time, so... What do you have to say about all that? I know that's a lot at once to, to, to talk about, but well, man, that's big, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, starting with the cold knife, I guess, I feel like that's just like alluding to the fact that winter is deadly. The cold is deadly. It's kind of murderous. And that relates to the others and how they're kind of like inhuman, deadly beings. Um, uh, dead king riding the horse. I don't know if I really have that much to say riding a horse, riding the dragon. I don't really know if I have that much to say about that. But it, yeah, uh, yeah. It's just kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a really, really cool piece of riding. It's a cool line. Yeah, I like it a lot. Right it's on. Good, cool imagery. Um, what about uh, Gemma? You also, oh, we'll go to you, Gemma, next, because you also have a side question to answer, which is from uh, Fred Targaryen's Uncle Daddy <laughs> Super Chat that says, Gemma, where did you get those pillows? So you have, you have to answer my question and you have to answer where you got these pillows. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer Fred first since he came up with the cold hard cash. Um, Amazon, <laughs> really boringly, uh, you can buy the covers, you have to buy the pillows separately. My husband went mental because I did spend £95 on scatter cushions. 
Prince. <laughs> They're so beautiful. And I have the whole collection except for Martel, which they didn't have. And I was really upset about that one. But maybe in due course, I'll get that one too. But in response to your question, Aziz, um, the language that we get here as Balerion's flying home with Area, it, it's it's so connected with just general imagery of the wall. It, it's almost as though we're not even in King, King's Landing. You know, if, if you weren't really paying attention, you could just assume that we're talking about what's going on at the wall here. So it's really hard to ignore. This isn't subtle or hidden in any way. So there is, again, it's another one of those, I put a bookmark in there and I'll come back to that one. It's going to mean something, I'm sure. I just haven't quite figured it out yet, but yeah, the connection is quite clear abundantly. Sounds good. Okay, Some, uh, Emmett, go ahead. Something I think is interesting is the the image of the dead king riding his steed into battle, whether it's a horse or dragon, whatever. We see this done in an almost satirical parody kind of way multiple times in the series where everyone thinks it's Renly who's back on the Blackwater riding his armor and horse into battle, but no, that's not Renly. That's hmm. Garland in his armor. It's, is that King Cleon riding forth from Astapor to do battle with the Yunkish? No, that's that's his corpse. That someone <laughs> just clapped into armor because they thought it would give hope to everybody. So mm. I think you do kind of see this this image of, on the one hand, the possibility of a dead king returning to life is an, a powerful, overwhelming, magical event, but it's also just something people do in a desperate attempt to prop up uh, the, a failing cause. And I think you see both of that in in this case of Arya coming home in Balerion. And then, on the one hand, you're seeing kind of Targaryen power at work, the 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 dragons and their magic and everything they used to got this far, but they're also seeing how that that magic has turned on them and is hurting their children, and that gets back to Maegor the Cruel, like sitting on the Iron Throne, but potentially being killed by it. This is kind of the history of House Targaryen, where the tools they live by are also what destroys them. And you have that those, those three horn blasts, which of course signal the arrival of the others if you're in the north, but it also signals Euron's arrival at the King's Moot in A Feast for Crows. Three horn blasts on Dragonbinder is how Euron announces his arrival there. So it seems to be this just this general signal of apocalyptic horror. And though you might start out in the series thinking it just belongs to the others, it seems to have a more broad meaning, encompassing all, all varieties of delightfully horrible things. <laughs> well said. <laughs> delightfully horrible things, indeed. Um, so... Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so that, that's one set of important parallels that I think this fandom will be, should be, and will be, and is digging into just how some of this language relates. We also, have, like like you said, Jim, there's other stuff that we didn't talk about, like his, there's all this talk of his wings casting this big shadow over King's Landing and all this, this darkness and everything that, that just goes along with it. Um, so that's, uh, that's rich. I really think that's, that's amazing. It's this, this, not, this is, you can guys see not this, this area Targaryen stuff isn't just about how amazing of a story it is, but it has all these applications to storylines that are yet to come. Um, we talked about the dragon homing signal thing, the dragon bonding thing. Now we have this, these Northern parallels. We talked about the fireworms a little bit and, and the magical fallout. Now here's, um, Let's talk about some of the things that happened as a result. Uh, a couple minor things. Uh, for example, this incident is where the Dragon Keepers came from. What the Balerion leaving, they, they made Balerion move back to the Red Keep. He was the first dragon, basically the first dragon forced to live in the Dragon Pit, which was recently completed. They created 77 Dragon Keepers, which I forget who pointed this out to me, uh, but it might have been LML. I don't remember. Someone pointed out that there was, maybe it was Joe Magician, I don't know. Someone pointed out there was... Ned actually sees suits of armor when he's walking with Littlefinger that match the description of the suits of armor that the Dragon Keepers wear. So that's neat. It's got the crest, the crest of um, the scales on top of the head going down to the back. So he, Ned sees a whole suit of, uh, a whole like row of suits like that. So that's pretty cool. So it's actually uh, tied back to early in book one. Um, we also have... Uh, so they're a lot more careful with the dragons from that point on. No one runs off with dragons anymore. They, there's more chaining and more uh, keeping watch over them. We also have some other uh, results. First of all, very oddly, not oddly, but notably, Barth doesn't allow, neither Barth nor Grandmaster Benefer allow Jaehaerys or Alysanne to see Arya. They don't even, they're not, no, you can't even see her. Like, and we don't get their response to that. We assume they just went along with it. Like, okay, we won't go in there. But it, this is the king and the queen. They, they, it couldn't have been easy to just say, nah, you can't go in there. And that'll be like, they'll be like, okay. 
Uh, so that was probably interesting. There was probably like a, a conversation there. No, seriously, you really, really, really don't want to go in there. No, no, seriously, you do not want to see what she looks like. Now, Quinn already has this as part of his background, which, by the way, awesome background you have there. But I want to put it up on screen as well because it's just so like, wow. So the Maesters had quite a bit of, on their hands with this and, uh, this is where we get the amazing writing. So, uh, Emmett, we'll start with you this time. Tell us what this reminds you of and tell us about, um, you know, George and horror writing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, George's horror writing is actually what first got me into his writing. Uh, I read his short story, Sand Kings. I forget it was compiled somewhere or someone sent me a PDF of it. But that's just a wonderful little story about this bored rich guy who gets this weird new species from like a pet store that he can make fight and eventually they turn on him. And well, that's great not story. exactly Two a great up. story. <laughs> well, it's not a direct parallel to anything in a song of ice and fire. I think it established that overall theme of, of bored, arrogant, rich people playing with species and magic. That's a little beyond their control and having it turn on them horribly. I think Martin kind of translated that into a more fantasy setting for a song of ice and fire. And yeah, the, the chilling way this is written, I just love how, Martin puts in terms of Barth saying like, I can't tell you what's going on this. I got to destroy this writing. Like this message will self-destruct like all these paragraphs that lead up to the actual revelation of what happened to her is just designed to make you flinch before you even know the details. It's like this horrible thing that lingered in the memory of everyone who saw it. And it's just sticking with them later. It reminds me of how Martin structures the Sam chapter in the storm of swords right after the attack on the fist of the first one by the whites. Like we don't, that chapter doesn't start with that attack. It starts with the aftermath and kind of builds up exactly how horrible it was by how people are dealing with it. And yeah, I think that's that, that slow creeping trepidation is something that Martin does really well in this horror writing. And it came through for sure here. Well said. Uh, Gemma, go ahead. Yeah, I, I love it when George R. R. Martin goes full blown horror on us. Um, he, he's so good at it. And Emmett, Emmett, you're so right. It is downright chilling. And there's something inherently human in us all that finds the idea of something alien or foreign or parasitic inside us utterly disgusting and terrifying. Just the concept. It's why it's used so often, especially in sci fi. Um, I said earlier on, Annette, worms with faces and snakes with hands. We, I mean, that just... <laughs> <laughs> but then we've got this kind of mutant hybrid, which is another thing that we naturally as humans find utterly abhorrent, this part dragon or worm or, dare I say it, part human, which is almost like the inverse of the Targaryen stillborn babies that we see, which are human fetuses with tails or wings. So there's there's a direct comparison there. Um, I think the implication's clear, though, that the Valerian dragon lords were mucking about with things they... Playing with fire, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> playing with fire and blood. <laughs> yes, well said. fire and blood, yeah. Um, to create some kind of manipulation, some kind of mu mutational manipulation within themselves, within their own blood, to create this blood of the dragon, this bond that they, they could have with dragons that other humans apparently can't, arguably. That's mm. possibly another conversation, though. All right, Quinn, what do you think? Yeah, these creatures, like these fire, these creatures could be like some kind of discarded remnants of some ancient Valyrian experiment. But I, I really like the like really gross language here when it says, "Her very eyes cooked within her skull and finally burst like two yeah. eggs left in a pot of boiling water for too long." <laughs> and then Christ. I love the way he writes, um, "The shock of that immersion stopped her heart at once." I tell myself, "If so, that was a mercy." For that's when the things came out. Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> yeah, went to the next page. I love that. It's so good. But yeah, it's definitely a great bit of horror. Like I said, this is my second part. This is my second favorite part, other than the part where the Kraken attacks. But yeah, I really enjoyed the horror writing. And yeah, the fact that they, the fact that he, they they had to keep this secret for so long that they covered it up, and they were like, we're not even going to let people even know that this happened. Like he was so disturbed by it. Yeah, it's just. This is... Yeah, because I know that if I saw this, <laughs> oh, man. I, don't, I don't even know if I would be the same. But... <laughs> That's what he says. He's like, I don't know if I'm ever going to sleep again. He's like, I don't know if I'm ever going to sleep again, guys, I... honestly. 
really <laughs> makes you itch just by just by reading. It's just like, ugh. yeah, it's it's amazing, and it's like this is like you said, it's, it's your second favorite part in the book. It also serves as an amazing. Uh, example of what a lot of us have been saying about how this book is different than the World of Ice and Fire. It's much more readable. Like there is nothing in the World of Ice and Fire that comes close to being written like this. That's like whoa. It doesn't have you on edge. Like you're chilled. Like you said, it makes your skin crawl or itch. As much as I love World of Ice and Fire, it does not have anything like this that just is written super awesome, chilling, amazing. Like yeah, it's just it's great. <laughs> um, it's also this is also a really good segue that that you mentioned that no one wrote about it or that Barth wrote about it in, in his privy papers and that of Grand Maester Benefer, who was a uh, very um, big on keeping records, didn't write about it at all. So we also have this is a good segue to a question we got from Rob Swellsey. Uh, who says, we didn't get as much Barth as we'd hoped, but I think we got enough to make some conclusions. The fireworms seem to have a little human blood like tar Targs have dragon blood. I was wondering what, in your opinion, why Baylor burned unnatural history. I think it shows that Targaryens are not made in the Seven Gods' image, but rather from unnatural sorcery or experimentation, and he didn't want that out in public. Well, that is, that is uh, I think you're on to something there. Some of these things we've talked about a little bit already. One thing that I think this really is interesting that relates to, and the reason I placed this question here where I did, is that it's mentioned that Barth's notes weren't found until for almost 100 years after his death. So, that means roughly they were found maybe in the range of 140 to 145, which is about 15 years before Baylor the Blessed became king. So that does line up fairly well. If his papers were discovered again, and... Some of the, you know, maybe that became the talk of the Citadel when this was found. People were like, holy crap, look what Barth wrote. Wow, what is this all about? So that could be maybe a catalyst to Baylor doing his thing, you know, 15 years later. started Because that, that was pretty soon in his reign, if I recall. It was almost immediately when he was uh, became king that he started doing these things. He set aside his wife right away. He's, yeah, I, I, I don't remember exactly when the book burnings were, but this is, it, the timing of, of George writing it as about a hundred years later is, is interesting for that reason. Anyone have something, any, go, yeah, go ahead. Something that struck me is this is one situation in which the Targaryens and the Citadel, who are often seem to be at odds, if and only behind the scenes, have kind of the same interest. Like the, the Targaryens don't have any interest in getting out that they're descended from sadistic sorcerers who played around with fireworms that's that's not their that not to their benefit in terms of cementing their place in westeros and the citadel is as marwin says trying to create a world without magic so they're on board with suppressing anything resembling this this sort of topic that's so both the word. targaryens and the maesters have this interest in suppressing the true kind of horrible origins of valyrian magic just for very different reasons and along those lines jaharis forbids upon pain of death his subjects from going to valyria after he talks to barth even yeah. though, and then he says, and he won't allow ships to, to come from the Smoking Sea or the Valyrian Islands. I like that it's called the Valyrian Islands. That threw me for a second. I was like, what Valyrian Islands? Like, oh yeah, they're islands now. <laughs> I was like, what? forgot that that's what they are. Yeah, I was like, wait, that's a continent. No, not anymore. Um, so did you guys have any, any, any comments on Jaharis banning it? Um, was that, uh, did that peak anyone's? Um... I think it was a good move. I mean, you don't want, <laughs> you don't want like those things infecting Westeros, whatever they were. Yeah, for real. <laughs> for it real. It kind of made me wonder how much did they actually tell Jaharis in yeah. that instance for him to to do that? Because the the suggestion is is very little. Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, they weren't allowed in the room. And then later, um, Bath explains that she said things. He doesn't tell us what those oh, things yeah. were, but he told his her mother and father that. Um, she didn't say anything, but he's but that was a lie. I wish we knew what she said. She God, said yeah. dark things like what, yeah. what are dark? What is that? Yeah, like, <laughs> some parched and cracked lips and whispers, and and then she begged to die. And oh, I would me. imagine that they just told you that it was like some horrible, horribly infectious disease, and it, that would be like very high risk if we went here. So just like don't even risk it. I don't know, something like that. Yeah, because if, if he didn't give Jaharis the whole story and just lied to him, said it was some sort of contagious, well, some sort of contagion, then that would really explain the whole, no one from Valeria can come here. It would be maybe not quite as fantastical, but it works It works both ways. Especially if up to that point they believed because Daenerys, the first Daenerys, had not yet died of the shivers. So right. if at that point they assumed Targaryens were invulnerable to all disease and then 
Jeharis is told she got infected and died, then that would have really terrified him that something that the Targaryens could contract had come from Valeria. Yeah. I think Arya's last words not being heard and just kind of being whispered reminds me very much of Quentin, who spat out a few words to Missandei Ooh, that we don't, nice. we don't know anything about. <laughs> and of course, he went through a, a horrible fire dragon-related death as well. So that that same kind of theme, I think. He that said, "Give me true. some skin lotion." Right. It puts the <laughs> lotion in. It puts the lotion in the basket, or it gets the yeah, exactly. So one, we're we're gonna go past eight because of our false start because we still have two important things to talk about. We are gonna skip um, comparisons to Arya, even though I think there's some good ones there. We talked a little bit about that, but we're gonna have to. We'll, we'll give that a skip and come. We'll talk about that in a future episode where we take it from an Arya point of view rather than from an Arya point of view. But because I want to spend our remaining time on the Ironborn parallels here. Vic we'll, we'll start with Victorian. I think he's a little simpler. Um, Just in general, Victorian's a little simpler, yeah, in <laughs> many respects. Ah, boom. <laughs> so true. I see uh, someone asking in the chat if we're going to talk about Alice Rivers. No, we're not going to talk about Alice Rivers today. Uh, we wanted to focus on the higher mystery stuff that's earlier in Fire and Blood because a lot of people still haven't finished the book yet. And Alice Rivers is one of the last things in the book. So mm -hmm. we'll get to her another day um, So when, when we have time to spend a lot of time on her. So, but sticking with this, um, Victorian, uh, his arm has that same kind of quality that uh, Araya's whole body was, was getting. And s slowly... And it has the same kind of quality, vaguely reminiscent of Makoro himself. Makoro doesn't have the cracking, smoking, but he is described as burnt. Not not black like, you know, African-American or something. He is black, like literally black. <laughs> burnt. Burnt like charred. And uh, he is, um, and then this is similar language to, uh, Vic the, the, the most stunning similar language, it's hard to miss, is is that Victorian looks at his own arm, it's smoking, and he thinks it's like pork crackling. And then Barth is, says, seven, you know, gods forgive me, pork crackling. He describes her skin as the same kind of thing. So uh, it's hard to not make that connection. Now, I don't know if we should go so far as to think that, as has been proposed by Jojo Lady Dane here in the chat, um, oh, she proposed this weeks ago, that there's little fireworms inside Victorian's arm. I mean... I, I don't think that's too far-fetched. It is a little far-fetched, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Um, one thing I want to do is keep an eye on that arm. Is his is that arm gonna grow? Like, will the will the flame creep up his arm even higher? So far, we haven't we haven't gotten a chance to see that. Like, it doesn't come up in in the in the spoiler chapter. We don't get a description of anything that's changing about him or if his arm if anything's happened if it's just the same or what have you. Um, so let's start with that real quick. What do you, do you got? What is your thoughts on? We'll start with um, Emmett this time. Connections between Victorian's arm and the descriptions of Area and any of that stuff. The description seems so much in common to me that I have to believe there's a deliberate link here. Just the the the, the sensory descriptions, the, the the horrible smell, the way you can almost taste it. I think that's that's definitely there. Obviously, as you say, it's a little far-fetched, but I think feel like Victorian's character specifically is a way for Martin to kind of flex his muscles and do certain things that would feel tonally out of place in the rest of the story. I feel like that's been repeatedly a thing in Victorian's chapters that Martin kind of can indulge in this kind of older school pirate genre in, in, in a way that doesn't necessarily fit with the rest of A Song of Ice and Fire, but fits within Victorian's POV specifically. And something weird and Lovecraftian like this, I think, would, would work very well. I also think it's worth noting that Makuro, the Red Priest who induces this state in Victorian, is associated with both Valyria and Euron. He points out to Tyrion when the Celesori Quran is passing by Valyria, and he notes to Tyrion that he has seen many people hunting Danny and his flames, including a tall and twisted thing with one black eye and ten long arms sailing on a sea of blood, which for a variety of reasons seems almost certain to be Euron. So Makuro and Victorian seem very much caught up in these images and themes that we see in this particular part of fire and blood whether that means we're going to see fireworms burst wriggling out of victorian's arm in the winds of winter i don't know i would love to because <laughs> i don't like i don't like victorian i would like to watch him die horribly i think that would be great what a way to go <laughs> exactly but I, I do i do think this fits into the general valeria body horror stuff we're talking about even if it's not a direct one-to-one -one parallel for sure cool all right uh quinn what do you think um, I don't think I don't think Victorian has necessarily fireworms in his arm, but I do think that it has a double purpose. Like Makoro gave him this arm, yet yeah, it'll keep you from dying for now. But then Makoro also says very ominously to Victorian, 
the Lord of Light has shown me in my fire the glory that awaits you. And he's, <laughs> and he's just, so I, 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 so I, it's definitely, it might grow, like you said, I, I kind of like that idea of it kind of growing and like kind of encompassing his whole body. I don't think it, I don't think that it's fire worms though, because it seems like by the time that Arya Targaryen starts to like, her skin starts to crackle, that's like kind of late in like the cycle kind of like she's not like that at first it like happens like later and then it like starts to get way way worse and her eyes boil out so it's not like it's not just like immediately like that but I, but um Makoro definitely did some kind of magic and like they say valyrian magic is rooted in fire and blood so maybe it's just similar magic it's like a similar form of elemental fire magic and so that would explain because if it's human flesh and you put fire on it it's gonna crackle like pork i mean that's what human flesh does when you burn it so i mean I don't know. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good take. Um, Gemma, what do you think? Um, I, I, yeah, we can't ignore the similarities in the language, as both of you, um, or three of you, have said. Um, I think it's clear that whatever's going on is not exactly the same. Um, whatever Makoro did could have been localized to this arm, whereas in the case of Araya, if she did drink the water, it was a, a, an all over body thing. This similar language slightly different scenarios um the worms could be a lot smaller it's been made very clear that they are of differing sizes from tiny tiny little slithers to giant 10 foot things um, <laughs> and another connection with makoro is um, when Bath's writing about the incident, um, he has like this little crisis of faith and says that he would be a septon with no religion. The only religion that he mentions is not being a septon. It's not the faith of the seven. He mentions the law. And mm. there's a connection there with Makoro, isn't there? So, yes. again, it's a post-it note for later reference. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Okay, well, there's probably a, f a few more things that will come from this Victorian area comparison. Uh, um, the fandom will, will probably toss it over in their minds, and maybe we'll have some more to say about it in a future episode. But let's talk about Euron. That's a bigger question, and I think probably one of the most important questions here. Let me throw out a few of my thoughts on this. Um, I, like I said earlier, I was of the opinion that, that uh, Euron could not have gone to Valyria because I thought it was a place of fire and brimstone. I thought it was like, literally impossible to go there. Like you just incinerate instantly. You can't breathe the air there. Now, I know some people have read Fire and Blood and think it's even less likely that Euron went to Valyria. But from my perspective, since I thought it was just completely impossible that you would burn to death the second you got there... That, so for, from my perspective now, it's it's more possible because I thought, you know, you can't be more impossible than impossible. Uh, so this this means that at least one person went there and survived. So that's already more than I thought was possible. Uh, so what I think is, I have a theory now. Um, so I'm going to get y'all guys' thoughts on both your, your general thought on this and on my little theory here, which is that something that Euron does and something that Victorian is going to do as well is using slaves to do things that are deadly. Something that Valyria does quite a lot as well. Obviously, they sent slaves into the mines, and those and they died of inhalation and of flame and of fireworms and of all sorts of awful things. Well, imagine Vic, imagine Euron sailing to Valyria and forcing some of his slaves to go inland and search around for treasure and loot. And hey, if you don't come back, you're going to die. And hey, I've tortured you your whole life, so you're going to do what I say. That's the kind of guy Euron is. That's how he gets people to do things. So I could see that. I could see. So he physically didn't step, set foot on shore, but he had other people do it and reap the rewards. So I, I'm, that's the thought I'm entertaining right now as a possibility for somehow that they could both be true. Euron didn't literally set foot on Valyria, but he did go there. Compare that to what he did with his horn blower. He had a dude blow the horn at the king at the king's moot. That dude died. Uh, so it's kind of a similar thing. And, and even though Victorian is going to get three dudes to blow the horn they they know they're going to die and they're still going to do it because well well there's there's for reasons so let's see uh Gemma, we'll start with you this time um what do you think about that theory and just this whole your take on euron now that we have new information um my take on euron is that 90 percent of what he says is bullshit <laughs> Good start. <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoyed your theory there because 
there's got to be some payoff to this in the main text, in my opinion. I can't see any other reason why it's been so startlingly included in the way it has, um, with so many details omitted that could connect to the main story. And this could be how this is going to be paid off, how this is going to come back around um, Euron himself, or like you said, sending other people to essentially do his dirty work. So I really enjoyed that. Cool. Uh, Quinn, what do you think? I really like your idea, but I I've always thought that Euron went to Valyria. Ooh, cool. All right. I like that. <laughs> I, I, I like some really of like side. the idea of Euron going to Valyria, and I have a lot of reasons why I don't really want to get into all of it right now. But yeah, I, I, I really like what you put forth about him going to Valyria. I, I, I like the idea of him sending men out to do his bidding like he did with, like Victorian is doing with the Dragon Binder. Interesting enough, this is kind of a segue, but I think that even if Victorian uses those other guys to blow the Dragon Binder, I think that Euron has probably already claimed the dragon horn. Because Makoro says to Victorian, you must claim it with blood. I don't think Euron would have given him the dragon binder if he wasn't already certain that it that the plan would go as he had already thought. So I, yeah, but yeah, that's the segue, like I said. I agree. I mean, I think the general point of there's no way Victorian's going to outthink Euron is yeah. just a general <laughs> truth there. Like, yeah, you're not going to outthink your brother. You're just not good at thinking. And he's quite good at thinking and manipulating. And it. Let's hear from you. Yeah, first of all, I agree that Euron knows that Victorian hates him. I don't think Euron would send this trump card away with Victorian if he didn't have some plan of making sure it worked. Who knows whether Euron's plan is going to come to fruition, but I'm sure he has that plan. And yeah, I love that theory that Euron sent a slave into Valyria. I think that's how you square the circle between... Uh, personally, like I've always taken Euron pretty seriously. I think he, the reason he hides a lot of what he's doing from the Ironborn isn't because there's nothing there, but because there's way more than he's willing to admit to them. I think if you look at the Forsaken, the released Aaron Dampere went, chapter from the Winds of Winter, he's up to far more than he's willing to convey to most Ironborn. I think that's what he's hiding from them. But you have to square that with when Roderick the Reader calls him out for maybe not having gone to Valyria, Euron freaks out. Like that's the only time he drops the I'm the most confident man in the world persona so i think this is how you put that together that he did he was daring and bold enough to go near valyria and steal his artifacts but he himself didn't walk there and i bet he does not like being reminded of that and as, you, <laughs> as you say this fits euron's mo where he has he has someone else blow the dragon horn he sends someone else to danny he leaves other people to hold the shield islands while he moves on i doubt euron ever intends to go back to the iron islands euron seems like he just hops from place to place and person to person and gathers whatever he can from them and moves on. So I think that fits him perfectly. It, it still it also fits with the theory that he got the egg and and maybe the horn from the warlocks because these things can both be true, right? Because one thing that never one thing that threw a, a little bit of a monkey wrench in the warlocks had all the loot theory was the Valyrian steel armor. Like that's the part I'm like they had that. I can see them having the horn. I can see them having the egg, but the armor. I'm like, yeah, ah, that's Agreed. that's a little rough. Like, where did they get that? So that one, that sort of pushed me back towards maybe he got that from Valyria. The armor is, is really, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go the, ahead. Armor, the armor to me is really weird because of the runes, especially. I would wonder, what do they do? Like, yeah. <laughs> does he have some kind of magical protection? And if so, from what? Like, I, I, I've seen some people suggest that, like, oh, maybe he's that it'll make him resistant to fire. I don't think that is how it works i think if a dragon breathes fire on he'll cook in his armor just like anybody else but it could protect him against maybe like the magic of someone like blood raven or bran Ooh, um, mm -hmm. but yeah that i know the horn has runes on it too um that valir that makoro gives us a translation for but yeah we haven't gotten a, a translation for these runes so yeah you wonder yeah it makes you think of things like um the bra the bronze armor of the uh of the Royces and things like that of those there's probably doesn't have any magic in it. <laughs> it might, but <laughs> maybe it's, maybe it used to work on, uh, older things, but yeah. Um, okay. So that has a lot of impact, a lot of potential to change what we think about the coming story. Um, we know that Euron's going to be a huge part of the story going forward. Um, and how, and, and where he's been and what he's done is probably going to matter. Um, it, it may, be part of his undoing and it may be part of um well it's almost certainly a part of where he's going in terms of the higher mysteries and big part of the plot so 
let's see if um, I want to let each of you guys uh, say more about Euron and Valyria before we shut it down for the day. Um, so any other thoughts on Euron, Valyria, on Erea, and on uh, Dragon Binding, on Fireworms, on Victorian's Arm, anything we missed? Um, if not, that'll be, that'll, we'll call it a day. I mean, I, I kind of think what we were talking about earlier with like the coin flip aspect of the Targaryen legacy and how fire and blood is both a curse and a blessing for them. Uh, you know, Euron seems to be someone who's just trying to hijack that legacy more than anything else. I mean, that's kind of the great and frustrating part about his character is that on one hand, he seems to just be kind of using a series of cheat codes to get through every interaction in his life, <laughs> which is kind of not that satisfying as a character, but also becomes a character trait in and of itself eventually if it's used often enough. And that, so I think I think we're seeing with Euron kind of the, the brutal endgame of all the Targaryen messing with magic and all the Valyrian stories. Right? Like this is what it looks like when the when that process has finally just run itself out. It's just this horrible drug addled psycho who's just dreaming on delusions of godhood. Obviously Euron isn't a Targaryen, but the fact that he's trying to live up to that image, I think says a lot about that image. The, the, yeah. the, the Ironborn, he wants the doctrine of Euron exceptionalism. <laughs> I think Euron probably discovered something that makes him believe that he can do something that he probably can't do. Like he has these yeah, delusions. Exactly. Yeah, he, th he thinks that whatever I've discovered will turn me into a god. It will make me a god. But it's going to ultimately backfire because you can't, you can't play with that kind of stuff. Like he, do he doesn't know what he's doing ultimately. We Agreed. have, um, Gemma, any other thoughts? Um, I've got a couple of thoughts on the, the fireworms or the worms, the kind of connections I was looking for or the connections. There was one in Fire and Blood itself where um, when the realm discusses Magor's inability to have children, the language is very interesting. They say his seed was full of worms. <laughs> um, I'm not really sure where I'm going with this, but it's just one of those pause points Ooh, that you think, Ooh. I missed that. Mm. Yeah, I, I missed it the first time. It was the second, and I'm like, whoa, hang on a second there. Um, the other one was the case of Aegon IV, um, who was described uh, on his deathbed as having a body crawling with worms. Um, I mm. sort of assumed this was like maggots like this rotten flesh kind of scenario. But the Maesters did say that they'd never seen the like of this before and pronounced it as a horror, as a judgment of the gods. Jeez. So maybe there's more to that. Good Again, catch. Just a pause point. That is worth considering for sure. I like that idea, as creepy as it is. <laughs> we got to think about <laughs> worms crawling in and out of people. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Lovely. We've got a uh, Acre Frey shout, um, super chat. He says, can we get a birthday shout out for Rebecca Santa? Yes, you can. Happy birthday, Rebecca Santa. Happy birthday. Three cheers birthday. for you. Happy birthday. Right on. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Um, unless there are more thoughts on this, I think we'll call that a night. Um, yes. As you guys can see, there's this is so much fun. This is really when the fandom comes alive. We're all playing with new material and that's just really what it's all about and it's just kind of it, this is foreshadowing meta foreshadowing for what what the winds of winter is going to be like for us all because as much fun as this is boy when the winds of winter comes out i don't even know do you guys have plans i'm going to ask you guys as creators do you know what you're going to do when the winds of winter comes out because we don't we thought about it. it's like one of those good problems to have or like how exactly are we going to cover so much material at once you know or not at once yeah. but how are we going to like compartmentalize I don't know. Good problem to have. Do you guys have thoughts on that? <laughs> well, I've been doing chapter unravelings. Um, I'm still on A Clash of Kings. So maybe it's taken me a year and a half to get halfway through A Clash of Kings. So maybe by the time I finish all yeah. of the books, it will actually be released. I mean, that like one <laughs> doing it one chapter at a time, like even doing it the way like Emmett, like your guys' podcast is a reread podcast, which is great. But like, can you imagine? Like it would take 80 weeks to go through The Winds yeah. of Winter. Or so, <laughs> like that, which is fine because it'll be years before Dream of Spring comes out. It's actually a totally fine way to do it, but uh, I, that's not necessarily what you've chosen. Do you, have yeah. you? So, Emmett, what do you think? What are you guys going to do? Uh, I guess lock myself in a room with a few edibles and a bunch of water. <laughs> <laughs> That's 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 probably the game plan at this point. <laughs> Take a bunch of time off work. That's I, I I hope the economy visibly slows down for a day. That would make me very happy <laughs> if enough people take off work to read the Winds of Winter. Qu oh, Quinn, what about you? What are you gonna do? 
Well, yeah, I've never like gone like chapter by chapter on my channel. I like I I just kind of like will like focus focus in on like an idea and just kind of extrapolate from that point. That's how I make my videos. So it just kind of comes naturally, you know. That makes sense. It's going to be harder to pick one thing. Be like, what yeah. do I start with? Oh my god! Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I have not. Yeah, I'm, I've thought about everything from like read the first chapter, podcast about the first chapter, and don't even go forward. Just like don't even read the second chapter yet. But the problem with that is some of them, some of these chapters are already out. And yeah. yeah, and maybe I don't know. People are gonna put people might spoil things in the chat. You know, like this is a good this 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 our chats are really good. People not spoiling things, but uh, you know, there's always it only takes one person <laughs> to screw it up. So <laughs> true, sadly, <laughs> it only takes one. That happened during season seven. We had uh, we had someone jump in with Viserion dies, which you can block that chat, but you can't block it if that's what their name is. They named themselves yeah. Viserion Dies. What a Where? jerk. Oh, no. <laughs> what a jerk. <laughs> some... There's always that one person. Yes, isn't there? that one person really got it. I was like, well, I, later, I was like, man, that was some pretty good trolling, actually. That was well played. <laughs> as much as I hate them, I was like, well, yeah, but good job. Anyway, okay. <laughs> All right, so thank you very much, everybody. Let's go around the circle and tell everyone uh, where to find you in social media and what you are working on next. So we'll start with the reverse order of how we started today. So we started with Gemma, so we'll start with Emmett to close out. Tell everybody where to find you and what uh, what's next for you in your uh, creator space. So you, I am uh, half of Not A Cast, a podcast going through the Song of Ice and Fire chapter by chapter, along with Jeff Hartland, a.k.a. Brendan Beefish. So you can find us at Podbean, on iTunes, on Google Play. Uh, we have a Patreon at patreon.com forward slash notacast, A-S-O-I-A-F, where you can get episodes early and special episodes and so on. I also have a Tumblr for as long as Tumblr lasts over at porkquentin.tumblr.com. And you can find me on Twitter at porkquentin. Uh, we're working on our, our Fire and Blood Patreon episodes, actually, uh, uh, perfectly enough, over at, at the Notacast. We did our first one in November. We're recording our second one soon for December and recording a third one in January. So uh, check that out, guys, if you have not already. Jeff is uh, was was commenting on your comments there while you were <laughs> your other half is in the chat. <laughs> I know. I saw him. <laughs> he called he you all man. Hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Bless I think, his heart. I think he was commenting on Quinn's biceps, too. So, you know. <laughs> True. True. <laughs> all right quinn your turn tell everyone where to find you and what you're working on next all right check me out ideas of ice and fire on youtube and twitter um up next the next video that will be on my channel will probably be my timelines of dune video um that might go up tonight if i finish editing it but yeah my channel is basically i do a lot of a song of ice and fire stuff and then i've got some other fantasy stuff like mr babylon i've got foundation by isaac asimov doom by frank herbert obviously has been really popular for me um but yeah check me out if you like science fiction and fantasy yeah. i would i want to say yeah i think that you know there's obviously everybody here is aware that there's a lot of people doing a song of ice and fire game of thrones uh creator stuff like we are but i i don't know anyone who's even close to you on dune stuff like you are like the man with dune like you're i don't know if it's like what you're most proud of or one of the things you're most proud of but like anyone out there likes dune that alone is reason to check Quinn out. He is, he's, yeah, nobody's, nobody talks doing like Quinn. So I'll give my two thumbs up there. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and Gemma, last but not least, what's up next for you? And uh, tell everybody where to find you. Um, I'm presently in the process of flooding my channel with fire and blood because it's just <laughs> so good to have new content something new and fresh to work with and i feel like you said earlier on i'm kind of going through this with my subscribers um the next thing i would like to work on is one of my favorite characters from fire and blood which is Alyssa farm and i think her story is oh, fascinating yeah. um but there was a lot of talk about dragon eggs in the chat earlier on it's just we we just didn't get around so much to get around to. Um, but I'm Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel. I'm at Citadel Secrets on Twitter, but I never go on Twitter. Um, I'm Secrets of the Citadel on Instagram, but I never go on Instagram either. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> I go on sometimes. Um, and I am very prolific, however, on Facebook um, in a group called Geek Chat One. That's the number one. Um, so... Come and check us out. I'm also a member of Geek Chat One, and some other creators are as well. So, yeah, it's a good spot to be. Um, so let me say thanks to all my guests. This was awesome. I will certainly be having 
regular guests every Tuesday. Again, this is every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard. We'll be doing this at least until Season 8 gets started. And then after Season 8, we'll revisit and see what's what. Um, so we'll hopefully see you guys most of these Tuesdays. We'll be having, like I said, regular guests. If you have certain guests you want to see, let me know. I've got a big master list of possible guests, and we'll be having different combinations of guests. Generally going to do about like kind of like this. We'll have probably two or three guests, depending on if, if a Shea is here uh, in front of the camera. It'll be the two of us with two guests, or if she's not here, we'll have three guests, something like that, depending on what we can do. But we're going to have almost everybody. By the time we get to April, we're going to have had just about everybody, and a lot of people will be on here multiple times. We're going to have so many great discussions. I'm looking forward to it. This was just the beginning. So many, like like uh, Gemma said, there's so much to talk about. We did get a question about the dragon eggs and Alyssa Farman, but that's we're going to cover that in another episode because that's a whole big topic. Alyssa Farman is a big topic. The dragon eggs are a big topic. So we'll be circling back to that. Um, as far as next week, we will not be doing this next week. There is no stream on Christmas Day, but there will be a stream on New Year's Day. They both happen to be, that's how the weeks work out this time. Everything, all the all the Tuesdays are holidays this year. So we will be streaming on New Year's Day, so you can catch us on January 1st, same time. And I'll be announcing the guests within the next few days. I believe we're going to have Gray Area, and we might have Lady Gwyn, and we're working on that. So we'll, uh, we'll I'll get the announcement settled once that's set in stone. Okay. Uh, thanks again, everybody. I'm going to do the Patreon credits and we will see you guys not next Tuesday, but the Tuesday after and Valar reread us Valar read us if you haven't finished fire and blood yet, but definitely reread us if you have, because it's like everything George writes, you can't get it all in, in one reading. <laughs> okay. Let's see everybody. Uh, thanks to our other patrons. We have um, R.I.P. Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow and Winterfell, writer of Mazla Cartho, the White Dragon with Green Scales, Horns, Wings, and Talons. Uh, also, shout out to our good friend Jinx of House Lier, Green Queen of the Rainwood, rumored daughter of a Woods Witch, writer of Irogenia, Sylphic Albino Dragon with Amethyst Eyes and Opalescent Wings. Thanks to the mysterious B.R., Hand of the King. Thanks to the Smiling Wolf, Lord Stephen Stark of the Broken Tower, soldier, scholar, philosopher, diplomat, hand of Queen Ashea, who is known as... The best, as my shirt confirms. My shirt never lies. Lady Suzanne Sinistral is the learned, not the lazy, as I accidentally said last week. That was such a great slip of the tongue. I'm glad that she took it in uh, good humor, as as uh, all slips of the tongue are meant to be, right? <laughs> she is holder of the left-handed Valyrian shears called Penance and Hand of the Beard. Lord Jim the Fortuitous of Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire blog is Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning is Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Kabethi and Frozen is Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light, Defender of the Old Gods and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington is Lady of the Ville Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld for the video intro. Uh, thanks also to Jesse Kowal for the music accompanying it. Thanks to Lord James Tuttle, King of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea, Commander of the Royal Fleet, consisting of the Narrow Fleet uh, led by Flagship Caraxes, and the Bloodstone Fleet led by Flagship Prince Damon. Our small council is led by Lord James Inkblade, the Scholar Knight, Master of Whispers. Also Lord Robert Jacobs, Master of Coin. Lord Daniel the Sneaky Russian, Master of Ships. Grand Maester Via James. And Lord Benjamin of House Hornwood, Master of Laws. We do have a Patreon vote going on right now, as I announced a, a, about two months ago. Until the Winds of Winter is out, all Patreon votes are for the next episode instead of just periodical. So you can right now, if you sign up, at an appropriate level, you can vote on whether we do Blood Raven 3 next, Nymeria 3 next, um, and a variety of other topics that are available to choose. Also, thanks to Lady Dyerliz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron, Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell, Breaker of the Second Stone, Lord Skip of the Velt, Lord of Castle Ganges, Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Bread Fort, many, many people's favorite patron name, Alicia Everlasting of the Green Blood is Lady of Desert Rose, Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass, Lord Garen de Havilland is of Gevil's Hand Keep, Ashlyn Winter is the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance. The Lord of the Castle Halls, uh, the Lord of the Halls of Castle Hillcrest, rather, is wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Bemmy Snuggle Bunny is guardian of the hidden hundred acre Werewood, dual wielding glorious morning and little light wise. Brian the Defender is Lord of the Spearfort and the Freelands. Last Scion of Clan McCulloch, Strength and Courage. The Bastard of the Wolfswood is First Forester of the Old Gods, sworn to House Iron Werewood, Listen for the Silence. 
Connor the Dungeon Master is Lord of Catamount Keep and Guardian of the Smoky Mountain Pass. Lady Baelish is Dark Widow of Harrenhal. Lord Sidney Jesse is the Fallborn, Lord of Blue Spring. Nevesa the Twin Hearted is suspected skin changer and holder of Castle Carahelm. Sir Valentin of House de Gen is creator of the Game of Predictions. Lady Lana Kelly of Wolf Island is protectress of the Steelhold. Casey Stark is of House Acres. And Lady Kay of House Archer is Lady of Earth Dog Hall, Huntress of the Wolf's Wood, and Guardian of Maddie Squirrel's Bane, the Mighty Direweenie. Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. Our Queen's High Council consists of Lady Maya Emerald Eyes, voice of House Swan, mistress of Whispers. Rebea Star Eyes, Lady of, Ca- of, of Waves and Mistress of Ships, Captain of the Iron Shadow Cat. In the shadows, we bear our claws. And Gra- Grand Maester M. Elizabeth is middle daughter of Liana Mormont, first lady to forge both the Silver and Valyrian Steel Link. Um, who else do I have? We have our King's Guard, Sir Dollars D, longest tenured White Sword, Willa Crowsbane, Guardian of the White Tree, first lady of the Free Folk, Sir Dean the White, Knight of the Black Star. Queen's Guard consists of Lord Captain Commander Hema Helminth, the Sellsword Sentinel. Lady Nymeria of House Sea Pertle, Alexander of House Atreides from the Seat of Dune, I Must Not Fear, Fear is the Mind Killer, Becca the Bard, Songbird of the North, Michonne the Melodious, Star of Old Town, Minds Over Masters, Sir Rambo Knight of House Ganon, First Blood, Sir Leon of House Walker, wielder of the twin Valyrian steel blades Fire and Ice, and the Werewood Bow Rain. Our Beard Guard consists of Lord Commander George the Golden, Sir Joshua Oakhart the White Oak, Lady Rita of the Copper Main, the Unbound, Dance the Fervor. Who gave me this shirt? Everybody, I forgot to announce that earlier, but Lady Rita is the glorious gifter of this wonderful shirt. Sir Jeff, Warden of the AC, is Wielder of Triad, the multifaceted beard of platinum, red and brown. Stay frosty. Sir Tim Corgyle is Mad Boy of the Western Desert. And last but not least, the history of Westeros' Night's Watch is led by Sir... Whoops, where'd he go? Where is the my Night's Watch at? Lord Commander Benjen Umber is the Silent Giant, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Greatsword, A Winter's Kiss, and he is backed up by First Ranger Zach Nefane Four Feathers, fastest bow in the watch, First Builder Magor Snow, a.k.a. Magor the Cool, the Fire and the Snow, and First Steward Sir Jurion of the Torrentine, called Palewind. I'll tell you what, folks, if you ever want to get really good at reading things, just try reading, go to, go to our supporters raid page and just do what I did, just read them all, and you get really good at reading things out loud. Uh, Because that's uh, that's hard. (laughs) Anyway, thanks for sitting through all that. Appreciate everybody who stuck around to hear the patron names. A lot of people uh, like hearing those. So it's and we really appreciate the support we get from everybody. Um, So that's it, everybody. See you all next Tuesday. Thanks again to my guests and um, have a great week.